Okay, live stream is up. PC recording done. Recording to the cloud, all set. Backup is rolling. Thank you. Sergeant Hope, you may take it away with the opening. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, and welcome to the New York City Council Preliminary Budget Hearing for the fiscal year 2022 on the Committee on Immigration. At this time, will all panelists please turn on your videos? I repeat, all panelists, please turn on your videos. Thank you. To minimize disruption, please place all electronic devices to vibrate or silent mode. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony, testimony at council.nyc.gov. I repeat, testimony at council.nyc.gov. Chairman Chaka, we are ready to begin. Buenos dias, everyone, and good morning to everyone. Uh, it is good to see your faces today uh, as we begin the FY22 Preliminary Budget Committee on Immigration today on March 8th. I want to begin with an opening statement. My name is Carlos Menchaca, Chair of the Committee on Immigration. Today we are focused on the Mayor's Fiscal 2022 Preliminary Plan as it relates to immigration services. This includes funding for the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, as well as several initiatives that together compromise the city's sanctuary systems. Before we begin, I want to offer some reflections. When I first started my role as immigration chair back in 2014 in my first term, there was no budget hearing that gave this committee the ability to have a role and responsibility of oversight during the budget negotiations. We fixed that. Over the last years, this committee, its members and community activists, families, young people, organizations have joined the council in keeping the mayoral administration and the agencies that execute the vision of the budget accountable. As the state budget closes on April 1st, I am reminded that we must call upon the state to create an immigration committee with budget oversight in Albany. And that should spread across the entire country. Every legislative body must feel compelled to do what we are doing here in New York and what you are participating today here in New York City. Last year, during the height of the pandemic, the council stood strong and defended the vast majority of immigration funding against the mayor's misplaced austerity. But we failed to defund the NYPD, which received the lion's share of last year's budget, and reinvest that money back into programs and services that would have made our city safer and healthier than it is now. The call to defund the NYPD was a call, a call for accountability, a call for a budget that reflected the priorities and principles of our most vulnerable neighbors. One of those priorities is a city that does not cooperate with ICE, that instead, instead seeks to dismantle and disentangle ourselves from a system designed to criminalize and deport the very New Yorkers who kept us fed in our economy and kept the economy going during the pandemic. It is these New Yorkers, the domestic workers, the day laborers, the delivery riders, the deliveristas, the laundry workers, the street vendors, restaurant owners, taxi drivers, who did the essential work to protect us and yet continue to struggle harder than any other New Yorker. That is why this year's budget is more consequential than last year. Last year was an emergency budget. This year, there are no excuses. It falls to the council to exercise its power in the name of justice. The rise in anti-Asian rhetoric and hate crimes is no accident. Anti-Asian racism has been in this country long before the pandemic. But what hurts the most is knowing that, our, uh, that so many cases go unreported because of language barriers or fears about drawing attention to an immigration status. It's hard to give a one size fits all solution, but more policing is definitely not the answer. We don't need to over criminalize our communities to keep them safe. What we need is to build trust by removing language barriers, 
investing in social services and assisting the survivors of crime, assaults, and all our businesses in our corridors. That is how we will build the social solidarity necessary to undo decades of scapegoating and stereotypes. I look forward to hearing how the city plans to address these needs of our Asian American New Yorkers, a community that has traditionally been underfunded by the city of New York, despite being one of its fastest growing segments. As it stands, the fiscal year 2022 preliminary budget does not adequately address the needs of our immigrant New Yorkers. While the administration funding for major initiatives such as Action NYC and IDNYC are included in the budget, major priorities of the council and the administrations funded this year are missing in this budget, such as $16.6 .6 million for NIFUP, $9.8 million for the adult literacy expansion, and $4 million for iCare, and $3.2 million for CUNY Citizenship Now, just to name a few. This committee is interested in hearing how Moya, the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, and the administration as a whole look to prioritize services for immigrants and how the city plans to ensure that these vital services are funded in fiscal year 22 and beyond. In addition, the fiscal year 22 preliminary budget does not address a major issue that this committee and council have raised that is now undeniable due to COVID the need for adequate language access. The administration's obligation under Local Law 30 of 2017 is to provide language access to all, including interpretation and translation for city services. The pandemic has shown us that language access is literally a matter of life and death. In fact, immigrants who speak languages other than English were more likely to contract the virus than their neighbors because of language barriers. Requests for translation services have almost doubled in response to COVID-19. The need to create a language interpreter bank is now more important than ever, not only for getting the right information to immigrants, but also to send a signal that we care about every New Yorker. New York City must take that step up and fully comply with local law 30. This priority must be reflected in our budget and committee this committee, the Immigration Committee, looks forward to hearing from Moya on how we get this done. Another major way that the administration can help our immigrant New Yorkers is addressing taxi medallions. This is a crisis, a crisis that this council has known for years. Yellow cab driving used to be an attractive job for immigrants who have access to driving a taxi or limo or can do so even if they are limited English proficiency. Unfortunately, New York City taxi medallions is in crisis and many largely immigrant drivers remain drowning in their debt. And that has compounded by the coronavirus pandemic. In 2018, nine taxi drivers in New York died by suicide, crushed under the financial pressure of debts owed to their medallions. With large monthly mortgage payments for their medallions, many owner drivers lost their homes suffered health complications, and their children could no longer afford college. Thus, it's important during these times that the administration and the city council together continue to lead the way in making our tax drivers' needs met. Now, we heard directly from many of these drivers just recently, both as chair of the Immigration Committee and Council Member Chin as chair of the Aging Committee. Finally, it has been less than two months since President Biden was sworn in and we have seen some positive changes that will improve some of the draconian immigration policies. Specifically and very dramatically different from the previous administration. This committee looks forward to hearing about the impact related to the executive orders, the US Citizenship Act of 2021 and other federal policies that will improve the living conditions of our neighbors, our immigrant neighbors and the support needed to implement those changes here at a local level. I wanna make sure that we thank our committee staff for their incredible work on this uh, and all of the budget hearings as, as we've worked on them together over the years. Financial analyst, Florentine Cabor, unit head, Krillian Francisco, committee council, Harbani Auja, policy analyst, Elizabeth Kronk, 
community liaison, Stella Chan, my chief of staff, Lorena Lucero, and communications director, Tony Chirito. I will now hand it over to the council committee, uh, Arbani Oja, to go over some of the procedural uh, items and swear in the administration as we begin to hear from them. Thank you all. Thank you, Chair. My name is Herbani Huja and I'm counsel to the Committee on Immigration for the New York City Council. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify when you will be unmuted by the host. I will be periodically calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called. I will be announcing who the next panelist will be. For everyone testifying today, please note that there may be a few seconds of de delay before you are unmuted and we thank you in advance for your patience. All hearing participants should submit written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. At today's hearing, the first panel will be representatives from the administration, followed by council member questions, and then the public will testify. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in the order in which you have raised your hand. I will now call on members of the administration to testify. Testimony will be provided by Bita Mustafi, Commissioner of the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. Additionally, the following representatives will be available for answering questions. Yasmin Farhang, Senior Advisor for Legal Initiatives at the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, and Anne Montesano, Executive Director of Interagency Initiatives and Language Access at the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. Before we begin, I will administer the oath. Commissioner Mostafi, Yasmin Farhang, and Anne Montesano, I will call on you each individually for a response. Please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Commissioner Mostofi? I do. Thank you. Gasmin Farhang? I do. Thank you. Anne Montesano? I do. Thank you. Commissioner, you may begin your testimony when you are ready. Um, thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you to Chairs Drum and Menchaca and the Committees on Finance and Immigration for holding this budget hearing. My name is Bita Mustofi. I'm the Commissioner for New York City's Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. Um, and I want to start by reiterating the mission of our office, which is really to promote the well-being of immigrant communities by recommending policies and programs that facilitate the successful inclusion of immigrants across our city in our civic, economic, and cultural life. Moya's work works to fulfill this mission by partnering with city agencies to support immigrants and to ensure that they can access city services and information that they need, regardless of their immigration status and ability to speak or understand English. Moya also ensures that immigrants, including emerging and vulnerable populations, have access to legal services and information that they need to stabilize, to, to exercise their rights and to stabilize their immigration status. Last but not least, as a mayor's office, we work to make sure that the city's voice is heard in state, national, and international discussions about immigrant rights and integration. Starting last year, New York City has faced unprecedented health, economic, and social crises, which have revealed and exacerbated underlying inequities and injustices. In order to address these issues, we've primarily focused on three areas in this past fiscal year. First, we focused on combating inequity and addressing the impact of COVID-19 on our communities. Second, we focused on institutionalizing some of our legal services work and programs. And finally, it has been particularly important this year for Moya to work to empower our communities through advocacy, outreach, and information sharing about critical services and needs. This testimony will briefly outline the challenges that we faced, how we work to address them and modify them and end with our discussions into the next year. As I previously testify, testified and as revealed through our own research and data, COVID-19 has had a disproportionate effect on our communities. 
The pandemic has devastated immigrant communities and forced all service providers to pivot away from in-person services. The federal response was slow to be kind, inequitable and lacking in at adequate support for local governments. Even when the federal government finally provided the level of relief for local communities, it excluded undocumented immigrants and initially mixed status households. At the same time, the Trump administration worked in this final year to remake the immigration system in furtherance of its anti-immigrant and racist agenda. First, they continued to prevent many immigrants from stabilizing their status and obtaining citizenship by exclusively prioritizing white, wealthy, and highly educated immigrants while neglecting the duty to support those fleeing humanitarian crises. Second, the Trump administration and its officials worked to undermine longstanding state and local policies aimed at building trust with immigrants and look to discourage immigrants from seeking the public benefits and services that they are very often entitled to. And finally, the gov federal government seized on the pandemic to justify attacks on immigrants and abandoned obligations to meet the basic needs of those in detention. Um, this year and its challenges forced us to pivot our work to respond to the realities, including by working to fill gaps left by an incomplete federal relief package and public benefit system. As the city looked to its own response to the COVID-19 crisis, we worked to ensure that New Yorkers had access to the help that they needed. As I testified in September, initially we partnered with the Open Society Foundation and the Mayor's Fund to create the New York City COVID-19 emergency relief effort and program to provide direct payments between $400 and $1,000 to over 24,000 New Yorkers which benefited them and their 52,000 people in their homes. With an additional support of $1.5 million from the Robin Hood Foundation, we were able to reach an additional 3,000 people, 1,000 recipients, and more than 2,000 folks in their households for a total of 79,000 individuals and their family members through this initiative. Moya also worked with the Mayor's Fund and HRA to secure $1.5 million in private funding to support New Yorkers, regardless of their status, to receive assistance to pay funeral expenses for their loved ones, recognizing the respect and dignity that every person should have. The Immigrant COVID-19 Burial Assistance Program helped address the exclusion of some families from the state and city's pre-existing programs. In response to the urgent need for housing relief among New Yorkers who were left out of federal relief, we partnered with DSS and HPD on Project Parachute, which is a coalition of property owners, nonprofits, and city agencies that have been committed to helping New Yorkers, again, that have been left out of these packages or longstanding benefit systems. In 2020, Project Parachute launched FASTEN, Funds and Services for Tenants Experiencing Needs which provides eviction prevention services and financial resources to New Yorkers, regardless of immigration status. The program has raised $10 million from various private funders, and we aim to raise 15 million in total. Additionally, sorry, to pay, help people pay their rent. Additionally, the city with Moya as a partner has worked to ensure that programming and support provided for emergency food, and health services in response to COVID and the tremendous investments in those areas are not are inclusive and accessible for all New Yorkers, regardless of immigration status. Moya has also shifted its own programming and assisted agency partners to ensure that vital city services remain accessible during the pandemic. That includes language access work I testified more extensively to in November, including the extensive interagency partnerships we've strengthened through that effort. Moya itself has expanded our own language services work. With the administration investing almost $1.2 million for our language services efforts over the last fiscal year. This investment provided fruit fortuitous with our in-house language services more than doubling its translation work in the last calendar year, on top of seeing an almost six-fold increase in telephonic interpretation. DCAS language services contracts expenditures, which do not in total include the Department of Education, Health and Hospitals, nor the uh, New York Police Department, or small business purchases, have doubled since the start of the de Blasio administration with a total expenditure of 8.3 million this last year. 
We've also adjusted our other programming to respond to the needs of the pandemic. For IDNYC, which was funded for over 18 million in fiscal year 2021, we, shut, we were forced to shut down permanent sites at the peak of the pandemic. And in response, the program extended the renewal period available to New Yorkers, launched a renewal by phone team, and reopened sites beginning in September. Currently, the program has four public enrollment centers uh, by March, so starting this week. We will host four additional pop-up locations. And IDNYC has launched three passive locations in September that are located at HRA locations to support SNAP and cash assistance clients. As another example, in the last year, We Speak New York programming was held online and featured COVID-19 resources that could be accessed by immigrant learners. Nevertheless, with a budget of approximately $745,000, $100,000, We Speak has expanded the reach of its materials and curricula through various new partnerships, including a partnership with the Division of Multilingual Learners at the Department of Education, and together with DOE's DML team, We Speak was able to disseminate 300,000 resources to schools in multiple languages, along with digital information and materials to principals, educators, parent coordinators, and counselors. Given the increased reliability on digital tools, We Speak also updated its website to add a chat box tool that helps answer questions for people on services in different languages and how to navigate the website itself. Finally, We Speak also focused on recovery planning for a deeper evaluation of our workforce initiative with the New Women New Yorkers, with hope of scaling this model if proved effective. Moya has partnered with h, &H to address ongoing and exacerbated healthcare disparities in the city through NYC Care. We, with our outreach partners expected to be funded at a total of 5.6 million since the program launched. NYC Care completed its citywide rollout four months ahead of schedule by launching in Manhattan and Queens in August of 2020. And as of December 31st, NYC Care Outreach Partners reached more than 173,000 un unique community members, and the program has proudly enrolled more than 50,000 New Yorkers across all five boroughs. In the legal services space, our attention was on ensuring that immigration legal services remained safe and accessible while identifying emerging and shifting needs. Our Action NYC services were conducted remotely beginning in March of 2020 and throughout the remainder of the year. However, work to fully institutionalize Action NYC in a city, in, as a city-funded service continued. In June 2020, Moya, along with our partners at DSS HRA, selected 22 immigrant legal services providers, including our consortia partners across the five boroughs for awards totaling $16 million to provide Action NYC services under two and a half year contracts through June of 2023 with an optional three year extension. The selected CBOs are uniquely positioned to meet community specific needs due to their immigration legal expertise, strong local ties, and cultural and lingu linguistic competence, and will serve immigrant communities that have historically been underrepresented and hard to reach. Moya also responded to additional needs exposed by the pandemic by expanding funding for some of our legal services programs. In 2020, as a result of the pandemic, we secured $150,000 in additional funding for the Rapid Response Legal Collaborative, which serves individuals who are at risk of immediate deportation and cannot be served by other forms of legal services available. This additional funding helped alleviate the high needs for legal services for New Yorker who continue to be detained by ICE despite the unprecedented risks to their health and safety during the pandemic. Similarly, in April of 2020, we allocated funds to replenish a DACA renewal pro, uh, fund initiative. Initially launched in January at just over 77,000 with an additional 150,000, which helped over 300 New York, Dreamer, New York City Dreamers who needed financial assistance to renew their applications. As we continue to monitor the situation, we realized that New Yorkers were unable to file many other types of applications for immigrant benefits due to the financial constraints of the pandemic. As a result, the original fund was expanded with an infusion of $300,000 with the help of uh, our Office of Economic Opportunity. 
In total, the fee funds covered the filing costs of over 375 DACA renewals and 160 applications for work authorization and dozens of applications for adjustment of status and naturalization, uh, and approximately 200 for other forms of relief. Through the advocacy of community members and advocates and with support of Moya, the city also continued to fund the Low Wage Worker Initiative, which provides legal assistance on a range of employment-based legal matters for vulnerable immigrant New Yorkers. In 2021, the city has invested 2 million and the council allocated 120,000 for outreach and education. By maintaining previous funding for legal services, the Low Wage Worker Initiative continues to provide critically needed services to New Yorkers and unemployed New Yorkers as the economic impact of the COVID-19 crisis continues. The Low Wage Worker Initiative will provide legal assistance on 1,500 to 2,000 cases this year. This includes legal advice and consultations, as well as full representation and advocacy with employers and government agencies through litigation. One of Moya's most important roles is serving immigrant communities on the ground by sharing information about resources and services in the community and in responding to issues or challenges raised. We work to empower our community members to act on their rights and access benefits available to them. We conduct Know Your Rights programming across our communities and cover different topics, utilizing different models to deliver crucial information. In 2020, we conducted over 700 forums, engaging thousands of New Yorkers. In addition to these events, our outreach and organizing team also actively communicated with immigrant New Yorkers across a variety of our campaigns. And as Moya has noted in various testimonies before this committee, this outreach is a crucial part of our overall work to provide timely, relevant information to immigrant New Yorkers and city around city services and programs. Our constituent helpline, another direct point of contact for immigrant New Yorkers across the city, remains responsive to the needs of our communities, collecting crucial information about uh, what's available and providing that to, to uh, New Yorkers who call. In 2020, the team saw its largest number of inquiries in the past few years as immigrant New Yorkers reached out to Moya for help during the pandemic. Our team received 14, 000, over 14,000 inquiries, 9,000 calls, and over 5,000 emails. And finally, as I have spoken to many times, we engaged in sustained advocacy on every at every level of government on behalf of immigrant New Yorkers. This includes work with city agencies in supporting litigation, submitting comments on federal regulations, and otherwise advocating for immigrants and their families. As we begin to plan for the next fiscal year, a few things are clear. First, the COVID-19 crisis and recovery is paramount. Moya, along with our sister agencies, are deeply involved in vaccine outreach to the immigrant community. More work surely remains to be done, and we look forward to coordinating with agency partners to ensure that every New Yorker can access the vaccine. Second, the change in the federal administration does not mean our advocacy at the federal level is complete. In fact, the possibilities presented require us to ensure that not only the Trump administration's noxious immigration policies are dismantled, and even more, that we advance real immigration reform. Moya is working with partners across the nation to push for a vision for an immigrant immigration system that addresses the longstanding inequities of the system itself and we will push that vision forward in the coming year. Finally, while we are hopeful that the new federal administration will work to provide much needed financial relief to the city and our communities, we need collective action at all levels of government to address this crisis. In order to build on the critical work of economic relief that we described and remains our greatest challenge, we must see real commitments at the state and federal levels to protect immigrant communities with basic needs for survival. While seeing the essential contributions of our communities in a fair and equitable recovery for all, I especially want to urge the state to pass the proposal to tax billionaires in order to fund relief for immigrant workers excluded from federal relief bills. Thank you again to the chairs, both of finance and immigration, Chairman Chaka and Chair Drum for this important hearing. And I look forward to working with you on many of these crucial issues and answering your questions today. Thank you for your testimony. I'm now gonna turn it to questions from Chairman Chaka, panelists from the administration. Please stay unmuted if possible during this question and answer period. Thank you, Chairman Chaka. 
Thank you, uh, Commissioner and your team who are here today to answer questions from us. And the members of the council who are here, I wanna welcome council members Drum, Lewis, Moya, and Chin. And I'm gonna ask a few questions, hand it over to council members and then finish off with a few more. And really where I wanted to start with is language access. Uh, so much of my opening and a lot of your testimony focused on language access. And I think that we can see eye to eye on what is needed for true language access across city agencies. The idea of a language bank is not new to us, the council or you at the administration or even in conversations within the advocates who have proposed this concept of a $2.2 million pilot a language interpreter bank. And we called on the, uh, the mayor to fund this. Can you give us an update on this specific request and where, where it sits right now in negotiations uh, from your perspective? Um, sure. So as, we, as I've testified to in the past, um, this is a proposal that certainly our office sees as valuable. It's something that we've independently looked at um, in addition to, to having conversations with the providers that have put it forward. Um, uh, the one sort of distinction in terms of the proposal itself that we've articulated is the importance and learnings um, that we saw through um, some of the, the small business services efforts on this front in providing a sort of model of shared backend support and administration to new cooperatives. Um, so we have supported that model. We've sort of added to the, the proposal itself um, by recommending uh, the inclusion of that uh, sort of back end support and business administration model that we have seen as successful through other uh, cooperative funded efforts um, and continue to be in conversations uh, with OMB um, in that regard. And so I don't have a new update in terms of current um, sort of status of this potentially being funded, but just uh, sharing with you that we, we support um, this idea and have actually built upon it in recommending sort of a further consideration of a, of a um, support, business support and operational um, CBO funded model. Well, and because of the pandemic, this idea that was born pre-pandemic served as a very kind of critical connection to access city services, services that we fund, and then just services for civic engagement across city agencies and the life of an immigrant family. Uh, with pan the pandemic, is do you see a, a role and a responsibility for Moya to inject this concept into the budget that is under COVID that allows for the growth and the, the blossoming of a language bank that can address COVID operations, which is separate and different from, I think, what the administration is trying to do. Uh, and you've articulated that a back-end city operation is, is, is a way through this. Uh, and I think what the Language Bank is saying, let's hire local community members to be able to be part of this, of this um, initiative. And would you take this on with us at the council level and advocates to to pressure a, a budget allocation from the COVID operations. Um, so just to clarify, in terms of the, the backend system, what I was referring to was previous cooperative models that exist that the city has funded and supported along with the council include the support of not city, a backend city operation, but a backend um, administrative operation through another not-for-profit. So for example, the Center for Family Life or Green, I forget the name of their the organization, but Anne, you can jump in and support me if you recall, um, who have experience and expertise in how to make sure that a co-op is successful. Because as we've seen time and time again, and we actually consulted at great length with other co-ops co um, as well as as a language services co-op, Ketakul, that unfortunately folded during the pandemic um, to understand what some of their challenges were. And universally, they were less on the skill set of, of the co-op members and more on the administrative business end. Um, and so uh, our recommendation is that in order for such a, such a model to be successful, it requires 
um, at least a, a couple year support on the administrative business side um, to get up and running and to be able to sort of move forward from there. In terms of sort of a response to the to the pandemic, look, I think you know you've you've heard um, me certainly speak at great length on this issue um, and appreciate the attention to how important language uh, services and access are um, for New Yorkers. I think that there that the I, the cooperative model is a great one. I also understand it will take time for that model to cement and to be able to be responsive. So I think we have to be able to do multiple things at once. So that includes shoring up as we have talked about the, the city system, the city contracts and the processes around language access and in parallel recognizing the importance of models like a cooperative model um, to ensuring the sort of, uh, you know, future ability to recover in a way that's inclusive of the community, that has the cultural and linguistic competence, but also that sets those efforts up for success. Okay, I, I, I think that, and I hope that, and, and I know you will, uh, that Moya leaves staff to listen to some of the panels that will, I think, have a different understanding of what we can do now in response to the emergency and crisis that we're in. Uh, in the pandemic and how we can really bring resources and, and really take what you've laid out as a foundation of support and a consideration of support mm -hmm. to actualize that so that we can actually build out a, um, a multi-prong approach that allows community members who are currently right now uh, not being paid, but also interpreting for neighbors. And, and I think this is part of the moment that allows for a crisis to reveal a need and to cement the current operations that are happening in our, in our communities, uh, especially with not just the language, but the cultural sensitivity that we're gonna need to be able to take the vaccine to the next level in communities that still are not getting them. So this is an, this is an idea that we're gonna continue, but I know with time, uh, I'm gonna pause here. I'm gonna hand it over to Council Member Chin for questions. Time starts now. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Commissioner, for your testimony. And uh, one of the things that I really wanted to uh, talk with you about is also the resources and funding for Moya. I mean, looking at the amount of work um, that you have to do. Um, and I really want you to be honest with us so that we can help advocate for more support, you know, for Moya, for Community uh, Commission Human Rights, because we had a, a forum recently uh, on the anti-Asian violence. And one of the issues is that, yes, you know, we have agency that could really help the community, but a lot, oftentimes lack of resources. Second is that following what uh, the chair talked about, language access. That is something that I always, that I have been advocating for a very long time even before I was in the city council. I mean, the idea of having every agency, having a language coordinator and having that capacity, I think is critical. Because what we saw um, in the, uh, during the pandemic is that a lot of times things get rolled out and it's only in English, not even in Spanish. Forget about all the other languages. And that's where the frustration is. Department of Health, you know, the whole thing with the vaccine or it was not in other languages. When Department of Small Business Service wrote out their program to help businesses, it was not in other languages. The application came out only in English. That is not right. I mean, having different languages would be number one priority. That anytime city agency put out any kind of program, it should be in the multilingual. I think in the long run, we have to see that city agency have to have that capacity. And oftentimes we see workers, employees who are bilingual are called to do extra duty. And the city has not given an exam for translation interpreter for many, many years. So we need a, a civil service uh, exam that really open up the pipeline uh, for employees that can speak 
different languages. Each agency should have that capacity. Because oftentimes when you do translation, if you don't know the program, it's hard to kind of like give the correct information. And we see that happening. So I think in the long run, we have to really focus on getting the agency, the capacity and the mindset, the language access. It should be the normal. And this is New York City. We have so many different languages and imagine educating our students for people to really value their language and culture and be able to get a job in city government or state government, federal government, utilizing that capacity, uh, that skill that they have. I, I think that's something that we need to look towards building um, for the future. So I really see Moya, when you were talking about all the different programs uh, that you have worked on, especially during pandemic, your role as the advocacy role for the immigrant community is greatly appreciated. But we just need to get uh, every city agency to have that capacity uh, to be able to do that. So I, I wanted to kind of ask you like, what is, how effective are you getting the other agency to work with you and, and to listen to you? Uh, and to really advocate for the resources. Yeah, thank you so much, Council Member Chen, and for for as you articulated, your really I think decades long um, commitment to to these issues and to championing ahead of your time um, how to think about and understand language access. Um, I, you know. I, I think I have testified before and sort of will refrain from going into too much detail about the import or, or sort of the response to um, the pandemic in March and how certainly there were tremendous challenges that required immediate sort of intervention through um, the task force that we co-chair with um, the emergency management, um, team as well as direct working directly working with the Department of Health with SBS with other other agencies to improve and adjust how they were rolling out the language access um, efforts in in the crisis period right in light of the sort of um, need for a necessity for swift to turn around um, so to be able to sort of do things at the same same time and, and there were definitely challenges um, and I have spoken to some of the efforts that were undertaken to address them and that continue to be looked at. Um, I'm gonna speak to sort of two, two more, um, but before doing so also want to sort of underscore um, that I, we, we are very much aligned that it's really critical that the agencies themselves um, have both the understanding, the priority and capacity to further this work in, in house. Um, as you, you noted, we can we can play the roles that we're playing. We can work to increase or, or better the way that we do that and how we do that, either you know ourselves or working through others or with others, but it's not the same as supplementing the ability for the agency itself to own this work and to drive it forward. So we're very much aligned on that. Um, and it's been a big part of the way we've approached this work. Um, there are two additional efforts that I want to highlight um, it, that are that are in process now that I think are important to reflecting on how we can do better, right, and the ways that we could do better. One is we're working closely with um, the Emer Office of Emergency Management um, uh, and actually connecting the the work of the the office with the work of our interagency task force um, to look at sort of what were the challenges in, in response and how can we be better situated as a city um, in the next emergency sort of and moving forward and into recovery efforts and sort of ensuring that through those, um, through that effort that's taking place, we have, we're bringing into it the, this, these issues and these particular lenses. Um, the second that I think is important as I've spoken to before is through the process um, that we've undertaken around the language access implementation plans, we're now at the stage where, you know, we only had one, one plan that's been implemented. We're now at the stage where we're working with agencies to revise their plans 
Um, and part of that includes addressing challenges that have been revealed over the course of the last year, certainly, but the last two years. That might mean you need more contracts in place, right? That, that we don't, you don't have a system in place that responds effectively to an emergency situation. That might be addressing some of the quality issues um, on translations that have been identified or highlighted, and that's through some best practices. That might be through reorientation of your websites, right? There are various things that mm -hmm. we have worked together. We've heard from you. We've heard from community partners. The agencies themselves are under, undergoing a review, and that will inform um, these plans, um, which I believe are due in June. Anything more you want to add to that, Anne? Yes, um, thank you, Council Member Chin, and uh, really just echo um, the sort of vision you laid out of expanding and increasing the capacity of city agencies to do the language access work. I think one of the core um, work and priorities at Moya within our language access team is really helping to increase that capacity within city agencies. And so we do that primarily through the language access coordinators, though not exclusively, um, convening those uh, coordinators throughout the year to share best practices, to disseminate guidance, um, to understand the challenges and to sort of address those challenges through trainings, um, and, and materials. And so through the, through the pandemic, we've done that also, um, having trainings to, for example, um, provide guidance on how you can make your website more accessible, um, how you can integrate language access into recovery planning. So that is a key part of the work that we do with agencies on language access. So how are, are the agencies responsive to you? I mean, are they cooperating? Are they working well with you? Or are they giving you a hard time? Or like they're not being that supportive? I can start and then Anne, you can certainly jump <laughs> in. Um, you know, I think the agencies were very responsive during the pandemic. I think that everybody was, um, you know, going through their, their own challenges and trying to reboot and reimagine the way that they did their work. and. Um, you know, we moved pretty, we moved with DOH pretty quickly to increasing both the um, amount of, of languages they were translating in uh, to, as well as the speed of translations, as well as the, the um, method of translations within a, you know, within a short period of time. It feels like it wasn't because every day was so critical. And we absolutely agree with that. Um, assessment and the need to, to do to do better and to have these systems more, um, as you said, a part of the rollout from the get as opposed to something that gets remedied a couple of weeks later. Um, we worked closely with SBS, one of the other agencies that you highlighted to bring not only this feedback, but also our language services teams sort of stepped up and stepped in to provide um, translations and other services for SBS to speed the process of their translations, as well as to ensure that any uh, uh, kind of rollout of programming as well as education was done in the different languages. And so people were responsive, um, I would say, and all of the agencies appreciated the support, I think, as much as we have progressed, the reality is this is fairly new for most agencies to do in such a robust way. Um, and we're learning and they're learning, right? Um, and it is really important to continue the conversation to ensure that it's prioritized um, and that the, as we have all articulated, um, both the skill sets as well as the processes and, and resources needed to do this work is inherent within the agencies themselves. And there are definitely agencies we have heard more about. And so our team is really focused on working directly with agencies that have, um, where we've heard the greatest challenges. Um, and also to ensure that, as Anne noted, we're, we're providing continued emphasis, guidance, and resource um, to all agencies as they continue these efforts. There, there's one, um, one more question, Chair, if I may, um, returning in, regarding the budget. Like, does Moya have a set-aside budget 
or if not, then we need to advocate for one because there's so many um, smaller organization that deals with um, immigrant groups, languages that we might not even familiar with. And we heard that, you know, through some of our hearings. And so, and they're oftentimes are the one that would, that will do the translation, you know, for the population that they serve that the city probably don't even recognize, right? And the other is that they should have the um, resource and support. I mean, they should be paid for doing some of that work in terms of translation. The other is money, you know, budget allocated to promote programs in the ethnic media, right? In the, and it should not be always like free media, right? A lot of time we expect the ethnic media, oh, free press, you know, we'll give them a press release and or the program and they'll publicize for us. But there should be budget allocated to support um, these ethnic media because they are often the one that reaches out broadly to immigrant community that might not uh, be served. And there's so many different languages that are being spoken uh, and they are a great resource, but they need our support. So we should not rely on just free media, but have budget set aside to put in, you know, ads and, and material so they can get that information out to the broader immigrant community population that's hard to reach. So is, does mayor have that budget set aside for that? Sure. So for the groups I, and the media. Yeah. Um, so I want to start by saying, by speaking to the media. Um, so this is an area that I think, you know, you're, you're well aware that not only our office, but the mayor has been deeply committed to around community and ethnic media. We signed, or he signed um, an executive order uh, maybe two years ago now, the pandemic's hard in terms of timelines, um, that required that every city agency spend at least 50% of its um, uh, uh, news and digital placements in community and ethnic media. Um, so all ad spending in that regard, we've seen really positive results from that. Um, in fact, with, with strong um, editorials that speak to that effort, having really sustained a lot of community and ethnic media outlets through this period of time, which I think is fantastic and certainly um, an important impact that that, that order has. Um, We've also seen a continued commitment to doing that work from agencies themselves, sort of a, a more deepened understanding and respect for the role that community and ethnic media play. Um, and so ensuring that in all the work that we've been doing around Test and Trace and um, uh, that CCHR has do been doing around um, discrimination um, that we have been doing around um, public charge um, and the importance to have support, not fear in engaging um, city services at this time that we've done through NYC CARE. All of those efforts have a hyper focus on the utilization of community and ethnic media, not just in earned media, but in our, in our spending. Um, so, um, you know, I, I can sort of share positively that that's happening and that's happening at a much higher rate because of both the executive order but also the efforts that we've undertaken internally to bring emphasis and understanding to the importance of using community and ethnic media. Additionally, on the earned side, um, we, my, my team who gets a lot of credit for this has really worked in the last year at centering um, the role of community and ethnic media and how we share information out and the importance in going into deeper conversations with community and ethnic media and making city officials available to them um, to, mm -hmm. to answer questions that are pertinent to their communities. So we've done, we do regular and continue to do and welcome your ideas and thoughts on this. Community and ethnic media roundtables with, with, um, with the media. We've also worked to support agencies in thinking about how to make uh, folks available to the community and ethnic media. And we've also developed um, a regular briefing that we send to community and ethnic media to, to facilitate or support um, information sharing and reporting that they do. So this is an area of deep commitment um, and I think a tremendous amount of, pro of progress. Um, 
not just again on utilizing them, but in actual ad dollars, um, but something we welcome continued conversation around. Um, and in terms of the first part of your question, I think it was just in terms of resources to continue to do this work effectively. Um, you know, we were definitely, or have definitely, I should say, had a positive relationship working with OMB as we've identified increased needs um, through our work um, as an office in this area. Um, we have been met positively with response. We are continuing to look at infrastructurally to be more responsive to your question. What are the ways we can um, improve how we do this work? Um, be it uh, the ability to support something like the language bank to support community providers in doing this work um, or mm -hmm. otherwise. Um, and that's something we keep looking at. But one of the ways that we have done that is through funding a few different sort of programs. Um, the Our Know Your Rights program, the NYC Care Outreach Effort and Initiative, um, the T2 Outreach Effort and Initiative, a, a really big part of the way we see that work is that it invites linguistically competent community providers to do the work in language. And so those are not small efforts, right? Those are year to year efforts. Um, and I think exist because of the proof that we've all sort of shown through, about why this work, work why this works, right? Both through our continued work together, but also through the census effort. And so, for T2, for instance, there's a, about 20, 20 something, um, I think, organizations that are funded with over 20, more, $20 million of investment in that work. Our Know Your Rights programming is really designed to reach communities that have been underserved and to your point in lesser used languages. Um, mm -hmm. So that the organizations themselves have the capacity internally to do that, that work with their communities Additionally, the, the NYC Care Outreach sort of uh, organizations are similarly selected um, to have that capacity and funded to do that work. And then lastly, I think to hit on the third point you made around working with languages that are lesser um, used or aren't in our top 10. This is something that we have been working directly with community providers on as, as things are either brought to our attention or revealed through our work or or others um, to start to improve how we do that translation work and when, and that informs some of what we recommend to other agencies. So for the Department of Health, for instance, um, you know, recommending the increase in languages, we not only based that, those languages on data that we have and census data, but also on work with, with the communities and feedback that we had been receiving from communities to expand what those languages are. Um, and we work closely with community providers. I can think of a few off the top of my head that I've even been engaged with like Adikar and others um, mm -hmm. for, for languages like Nepali or um, Tibetan or other languages um, to improve the quality of the translations when they're done in those languages and how they're done. So we've worked to develop a glossary of terms for instance, for our vendors. Mm -hmm. um, and those are efforts that are you know, they're really, really critical, but I agree there should be more of, and I think part of it is people knowing that they can come to us for those things when they see them. Um, and part of it is is just in systems wise, making sure that we're being thoughtful about how we, we do the education and information sharing around them with the agencies. Thank Great. you, Commissioner. Um, yeah. and Thank you. Uh, Council Member Chin. And we've also been joined by Council Member Matthew Eugene from Brooklyn as well. Uh, and I know that we're going to have to transition to our, our panels. Uh, and can you identify who is going to stay here from Moya to review all the testimony from the public? Um, I think I have a number of folks on. <laughs> okay, okay so I will ask them to identify. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. and, and here's my, my final piece. Uh, clearly that we have we have dozens of questions that we're gonna send you uh, so that we can get a reply from, uh, so that we can help build our council response. Uh, we wanna ensure that the council response, that the people's body uh, is clear about what's happening. And I believe as a city council member and chair of the immigration committee that local 
law 30 of 2017 is not being followed. Uh, and so what do we do with that? What happens when the city council writes a law, passes it, and the mayor's office and the, and the agencies are not following it? Like, what do we do? What happens? Uh, and and that's, the, that's the crux of this whole conversation that we're having here. Uh, and, and we need to hold somebody accountable. And the way that we do that is through budget to reallocate, to rethink how we do what we do. Uh, and I hope that you're open so, to some of these things. And I hope that our colleagues are open to some of these things so we can actually address these issues. Because what we're not asking New Yorkers about is like how to connect to a service like a free tree, a fruit tree that you, they can take home. But we're talking about our legal services um, conversations around the vaccine so that we can get people excited and signed up. Like this is about life and death. And I know that I hear the urgency in your voice and in your work, um, but it is not enough. And what do we do when that happens? And what is the city and the budget going to look like to respond to those things? And so that's the crux of where we are right now. And we're going to be hearing from several panels today about those issues. And we will be following up with you, Commissioner. Um, afterward. Thank you. And just to note, um, Yasmin and Zainab from our team will be on to start um, in terms of listening and, and others will join as they transition out. Great. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. And I hope you have a safe and healthy day. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. And I will now hand it back to committee council Harbani Oja. Thank you, chair. Um, we're now, uh, we've now concluded administration testimony and we will be turning to public testimony. I'd like to remind everyone that we will be calling on individuals one by one to testify and each panelist will be given two minutes to speak. For panelists, after I call your name, a member of our staff will unmute you. There may be a few seconds of delay before you are unmuted and we thank you in advance for your patience. Please wait a brief moment for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin before starting your testimony. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you after the panel has completed their testimony in the order in which you have raised your hands. I'd like to now welcome our first public panel. In order, I will be calling on Veronica Piera Leon followed by Yesenia Mata, followed by Vanessa Marquez. Veronica Piera Leon, you may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Good afternoon, Chairperson and Chaka and the distinguished members of the New York City Council, Committee on Immigration. On behalf of the New York City Day Labor Coalition, I want to thank you for this opportunity to testify today in support of the Day Labor Workforce Development Initiative. The Day Labor Workforce Development Initiative came together to address the needs of day laborers, men and women looking for employment in open air markets by the side of the road, at busy intersections, in front of home improvement stores and in other public areas. As members of the city's informal, informal workforce, day laborers experience rampant wage theft, pervasive construction accidents, workforce hazards, lack of access to workforce development, training, and lack of infrastructure. The initiative's goals have focused on addressing these issues by linking day laborers to vital services, providing trainings on workforce safety and legal rights, addressing wage theft, providing access to jobs, and most importantly, creating safe and dignified spaces for day laborers to congregate as they search for gainful work. Historically, day laborers have played a vital role in disaster relief efforts throughout the country in places like New York after Hurricane Sandy and New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina. Since the offset of the COVID-19 pandemic and throughout this pandemic, day labor centers have served as emergency response hubs, providing essential services to New Yorkers in high impact areas. We thank uh, the Mayor's Office for Immigrant Affairs for their ongoing partnership during this pandemic. Without their support and the support of the council through this initiative, we would, we would have not been able to, to do the work that we do. The initiative organizations, La Colmena, New York Immigrant Community Empowerment, uh, Workers Justice Project, Project, Catholic Charities, and the Northern Manhattan, 
Manhattan Coalition for Immigrant Rights, also known as the Coalition for Immigrant Freedom, have all been instrumental in the emergency recovery work that has taken place post-pandemic and continue to be a partner. And we hope to be considered a partner in an active role, um, to have an active role in the post-recovery um, economy that we're trying to do. So we thank the council for the support that you have given us throughout all these years. We thank Chairperson Menchaca for his support. And we hope to continue to count with the support of the council and the partners across all the different government agencies that continue to fund the work that we do. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Yesenia Mata to testify. After Yesenia, we will be hearing from Man Manuel Castro. Um, Yesenia, you may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. My name is Yesenia Matan. I am the executive director of La Colmena, an immigrant and day labor rights organization based in Staten Island, New York. When the pandemic began and many shut their doors on Staten Island, La Colmena decided to keep its doors open because we knew that immigrant workers were going to be affected the most. Throughout the pandemic, we took the role that many elected officials on Staten Island failed to take. We took the role of proving that we as a community are essential. We provided mutual aid through food distribution, through economic support, through COVID testing, and even vaccine distribution. And still we continued with our services of dispatching day laborers to their jobs and conducting SST and OSHA classes. At a moment that we should have fallen, we didn't. If anything, we grew and became more organized, outreaching to immigrants in every job sector. Today, also you will hear from Sarai from Plaza San Jerónimo, an immigrant owned restaurant who through the pandemic struggled because the city was inefficient to know how to outreach to the immigrant owned businesses, restaurants who had language barriers, tech, technological barriers and mistress or didn't know who to connect with. This is another role that La Colmena took to connect with all immigrant workers. La Colmena is now in the process of opening up another center. Why? Because of the need of the, of the support that immigrant workers have. Why? Because elected officials have failed time after time to provide support, but not us. We are here more organized than ever and ready to not only support immigrant businesses and immigrant workers, but the city of New York to recover. As we have been doing throughout this time, the question I ask now is what would have happened had La Colmena not been here? The reason we were able to continue providing mutual aid is because we are from Staten Island and we know Staten Island. Time expired. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Manuel Castro to testify. Um, following Manuel Castro, we will be hearing from Nadia Molina, followed by Sarahi Marquez. Um, Manuel Castro, you may begin when you are ready. Thank you. Start now. Thank you, and uh, good afternoon uh, uh, to Chairman Carlos Menchaca and members of the Committee on Immigration. Uh, my name is Manuel Castro, and I'm the Executive Director of NICE, a new immigrant community empowerment. Uh, I am here to also testify uh, in support of the Day Labor Workforce Initiative that supports day labor centers across all five boroughs of New York City. And I, I am here to emphasize how critical these centers have been during the pandemic and will be for years to come as immigrants re-enter the workforce in large numbers and will continue to sustain the city, but unfortunately will be at an incredibly high risk of workplace abuse and unsafe conditions. So NICE is now located in Queens, the early epicenter of the pandemic, and our members would usually gather at this center to organize jobs and receive other critical services. But when the pandemic hit us, the center truly became a refuge, not just for, for our members who were using our center, for, but for the many thousands of workers who have received services from us across the years. We immediately started to reach out to all of our members, uh, organizing one of the largest phone banks we've ever organized. We spoke with over 5,000 of, of our members 
and quickly learned what eventually experts would find out that our communities would be disproportionately impacted uh, by this pandemic and that their entire uh, that entire households were being ravaged by the virus. So we immediately became a center for all these workers and our communities to receive critical information about the, the, the virus, to receive PPE, uh, and to receive uh, food assistance. Time we expired. Also we also developed a strategic plan where we raised uh, cash assistance to directly support workers that were losing their jobs and that were, that were losing their homes. And to date, we have distributed over $2.5 million in cash assistance, something that none of the local governments or none of the governments at any level has been able to do for this population. So with that, I want to say, you know, hopefully uh, the city council will continue to recognize and support these centers as vital resources for these communities. And we hope that you consider our budget priorities and recommendations in this ne next upcoming budget negotiation. Uh, I thank you for your, your support and for your time today. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Nadia Molina to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Um, thank you to, to the committee. I'm Nadia Marin Molina uh, from the National Day Labor Organizing Network, or NDLA. Um, and I'd like to give a special thank you to Council Member Menchaca for your leadership and for your work as a champion, um, always making sure that day laborers and other workers are recognized for their contributions rather than criminalized and excluded. Um, I'm testifying also in support of the Day Labor Workforce Initiative, which has had astounding success um, since it began. Um, Endilon supported the DLWI when it was just an idea um, that, NY, that New York City should support day labor centers, and it was only three small organizations. Now they're in every borough and reaching thousands and thousands of workers across the city. In the pandemic, this went to an entirely different level. Day labor organizations were partners with the city in distributing millions in cash assistance, reaching huge numbers with desperately needed food and continuing their traditional work in enforcing workers' rights. Meanwhile, pushing for equal access to COVID relief from the state and federal governments. And they really showed an ability to transform, adapt, act quickly and respond to their community's local needs. We're asking that the city continue to see the day labor centers as active partners in the recovery um, and this will be increasingly important, not less, as we work in the recovery to have jobs with standards and dignity. Um, active campaign, there's an active campaign to create funds for excluded workers. Um, the state funds, if this passes, workers will be coming to the centers for support and accessing these funds. Um, you may have seen the, the large actions on Friday, which the members mo uh, mobilized for. Um, in health and safety, education and access to vaccines will be key. Federal policymakers, um, which you mentioned, Councilmember Menchaca, are looking at all kinds of proposed legislation for citizenship, um, as well as for smaller legalizations and administrative action. I'm inspired. So the, re regardless, the need for the day labor uh, coalition and their work is going to continue. And we're just asking that New York City continue to support their, their expansion and their development. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Sarahi Marquez to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Hi, Hello, everyone. So. My name is Sarahi Marquez, and I'm a DACA recipient and an immigrant restaurant owner. Through the pandemic, uh, I saw many businesses shut down, especially immigrant-owned businesses at a much higher rate. And I do not know where we would be without the help of La Comena, who constantly kept reaching out to us on a weekly basis, providing us with PPE and information of resources available to us. Um, uh, they also highlighted not only the businesses, but all of the immigrant owned businesses on Staten Island. I wonder what would have happened to my father, an immigrant man with 
limited English. Uh, I am the only one in my family who is tech savvy and can speak English and, and able to connect with organizations. And I do not know how other businesses, especially the immigrant owned businesses do it without the support of, of, of someone who can help them. Um, it was a really difficult time, especially for my employees, many whom I had to let go because of the pandemic and because we couldn't pay them. We're currently still very much struggling. Uh, so much, we're so under so much stress that my father just recently went to the hospital because of chest pains. So it's really been a huge burden for us. And um, I, I just would wish that elected officials wouldn't forget about Staten Island and, and know that we, we are in need and we need support. And we would very much like if the city would support organizations like the Comena I'm who has helped many immigrant owned businesses like myself here in Staten Island. And uh, because they know the community and are they are part of the community. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Lihia Gualpa to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Thank you so much uh, for inviting me to be part of this panel, especially um, the chairman, Carlos Menchaca, for his unconditional support um, to the workforce, uh, for the day labor workforce, um, day labor initiative, and the worker centers um, who have been the frontline organizations um, and emergency response centers for thousands of day laborers um, who live and work in our city. My name is Ligia Walpa, and I am the executive director of the Workers Justice Project, a worker center that turned into emergency relief center for more than 20,000 day laborers, domestic workers, and delivery workers um, who were left out to survive this pandemic without um, a safety net, without economic relief, um, and even without, without essential rights. Um, through the Workforce Day Labor Initiative, Workers Justice Project has built a strong worker-led infrastructure that has been essential to the survival of frontline immigrant workers and to the recovery effort of our city as well. From north to south, uh, we're currently operating three worker centers that has been distributing close to $2 million in cash relief, distributed more than 10,000 boxes of groceries, over $12,000 of safety masks, even turning in one of our centers in a small factory that was producing over a thousand masks during COVID time, um, has been training over a thousand workers in 40 hours construction safety and creating thousand jobs um, for essential and excluded workers. We're operating our centers at its maximal capacity, partner, partnering with city government agencies, mutual aid groups, community members to respond to the growing needs of our, um, of our communities. The truth is that day labor centers um, like Workers Justice Project have become more essential than ever to our city's recovery. I'm we're sorry. grateful. We're grateful for the support, and we hope that you will con continue um, to conditionally um, support the day labor workforce initiative and put this initiative um, as part of your um, top budget priorities. Uh, during this budget negotiation process and continue to play a critical and essential role to the, our city's recovery during this um, difficult time and the worst crisis of our time um, in New York City. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Alba Villa to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Good afternoon, everyone. I thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, and I, I will say that I am submitting written testimony. Um, I uh, almost couldn't be here tonight because today because my son woke up sick. Um, and I was reminded actually of the last time I testified before you um, where one of our workers uh, had just lost a family member that morning and still came to our offices to testify. Uh, he actually inspired me to um, while I wait for the doctor to get back to me, just jump on and let you know how important it is to have your support during this time. 
Uh, I am the executive director of the Coalition for Immigrant Freedom, also known as Northern Manhattan Coalition for Immigrant Rights, uh, who, which has been around since 1982, serving the community. We chose to change our name and are in the process of doing so because we really believe we need to be talking about not just providing the needs our community constantly demands rightfully, but also helping them find freedom in their daily lives. And it's difficult to find freedom when you are under constant struggle and constraints. And despite my privilege and my ability to lead an organization and how, be able to take care of uh, my child who is sick, which many of our community members cannot, I also am feeling the brunt as the leader of an organization who has been open since the pandemic, whose staff, uh, almost half of our staff has had to deal with COVID, who has seen the, the impact of budget cuts and is concerned now, I have to think about whether we paid our insurance premium or not to make sure I can see uh, my son's doctor because it has been that difficult during the pandemic for us as a immigrant led uh, community-based organization, we have been surviving by the thin of our skin um, while we meet the community's needs. And so I urge you today to help us continue to do that. and move beyond the ability to help people just survive their needs and really transform our community's ability to thrive. And that's why I'm here um, for a few minutes to let you know that all the initiatives that you have held support has really allowed us to transform the work we do, uh, not only through the worker center that transforms worker development training through dispatching and worker education that's not only relevant culturally and uplifting, but is also helping our city and our society as a whole. We are in dire need to continue the immigration legal services that we provide, the worker services that we provide, the adult literacy services we provide. Um, our funding keeps getting cut and we are being asked to do more with less. Um, and I think it's reflective of the uh, of all the systemic failures that this pandemic has exposed in our country with the disparities that exist in communities of color, including community-based organizations. So I ask you today to help me help me and my staff help our community meet the challenges of this pandemic by continuing to support us and ensuring that the funding that we received is given without delay so that we can do our work in the best way possible. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Um, I'm now gonna turn it to Chairman Chaka for questions. I wanna say thank you, Alba, Ligia, Veronica, Nadia, Manny, uh, Sarahi, Yesenia. Thank you all for testifying. There's a reason why we started with the day laborers organizations and the incredible coalition that you have really brought into existence. Uh, the work that you were doing happened before the city council got involved, uh, but it is when government got involved with a day labor initiative that continued to grow over the years and support from the city council members that you also began to grow. And that the way that this happened was for the city of New York to use tax levy dollars to support this organizing because we knew that this was the role that you would all play. And now, at a time when the budget is decreasing, we have to make a choice. You are all doing incredible work. I also wanna highlight the fact that um, many of you are led by women and today is International Women's Day. This is the power of our communities, especially immigrant women, mothers who are fighting on the ground and supporting everyone with everything that they have and many times with nothing. Um, and yet you make that happen. And all we're asking is the city of New York support that organizing and allow you all to make the decisions on the ground to ensure that everyone gets what they need. Uh, and I think that's the question today. And so I just wanna say thank you for, for this work. And maybe the one question that I have for you is, as we begin to reopen uh, slowly, and that's gonna be a testament to our ability to get the vaccine out. We've already talked about language access playing a big role in how communities, especially immigrant communities, get access to the vaccine, all of that. What do you need the most right now to ensure that you can continue to do that work, grow it in coalition in the city of New York right now? And I'll, I'll take two or three of you to, to kind of talk through uh, and bring new ideas as one person speaks. Um, 
Thank you, Councilmember Manchaca. Um, you brought tears to my eyes. Um, I, I think what we need is um, access and and funding. And I'll give you an example. Uh, access. Uh, we have partnered with New York Presbyterian to uh, uh, that allows us to directly register community members to get their vaccines. I can guarantee you that the dozens of uh, community members we've registered would not have gotten a vaccine without that ability for us to say, give them the education and the, and the confidence they need to say yes to a vaccine and then say, okay, you're scheduled for next Wednesday. What do you need to get there? Um, so that's a very specific example of how it works. Um, another example is when we were uh, awarded the uh, Moya's uh, cash distribution funds, it was given upfront and without delay. We were able to meet that demand. We were able to help more than a, a thousand families distribute $850,000. We were able to do it because we got the funding support to do that. We have tried to do other referral type work, but without funding, I cannot allow, I cannot ask my staff to do more than they're already doing with reduced hours, furloughed schedules. Um, and so we need access, access to directly register our community because they are gonna come to us mm -hmm. as a trusted uh, partner um, and we need funding to be able to continue doing it. So I don't have to worry about how I'm gonna, uh, if I'm gonna meet payroll next week or not. Thank you, Alba. And I know there's yeah. some others that, that raised a hand to respond. Yeah, I, I, can, I can go next. Um, um, first of all, I just want to second with Alba about the funding, um, making sure day labor workforce initiative, it's part of your top priority or one of your, you know, biggest priorities for this coming year. And the second one that I wanted to mention a little bit is about the, the institutionalizing a lot of the services that it's being provided to our communities, just quickly about it, making it less institutionalized the COVID uh, test, I mean, the COVID vaccinations, um, the SSTs is becoming just a whole disaster about how the whole process, like um, it's being done. Um, so really thinking through about how we, we, we don't continuously institutionalize services that we need to make sure it gets to our communities quicker, faster. And we're here as community groups to do that. So rely on us because we're here and we're ready to get whatever essential services it's needed it to the hands of, of our communities. Right. Thank you, Ligia. I can go next. I think just to echo what Alva and Ligia have said, it's about figuring out and thinking innovatively about how each of the other initiatives can be looped in and how we can, with language access, make sure that we break down barriers of language because we not only have 22 languages, we have dialects that are not even taken into consideration. There's no translation services for them. So it's really thinking about how do we get to those who were in high impacted areas with no resources whatsoever? How do we utilize the centers that are so crucial and are in this high impacted areas and we give them the funding, the resources and, it, and the connection with other government agencies and looping the centers into other initiatives to think about a model of rapid response. This is about making sure that we build trust with the communities that we serve, emphasize the need for this vaccine, but also think creatively about how we use this model to expand and extend the services that the city provides to New Yorkers across different areas. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I Manny. would just like to add, and hi everyone, it's Manny again. Um, you know, right now thousands of immigrants are looking for work. You know, after many months of not being able to work, having run out of savings, having depleted all their economic, you know, resources. Um, and that's exactly the population we serve. Day labor centers for many years have focused on finding work and helping immigrants find good, well-paid, dignified work. Now, you know, um, this population has just grown. And because of the pandemic, I mean, all of our centers are doing three, four times as much as we were doing. And so I just want to emphasize that. Well, and this is among the only, well, I think this is the only initiative of organizations that are actually helping immigrants get uh, find work and be placed in work and provide that additional training and perhaps the only initiative in the country 
that is doing that. So it's something really important to lift up and continue to support uh, because the, the, the coming year, I mean, the coming five years are going to be critical uh, for this economic recovery. And so, but before we get to that, we need to make sure that all of our members, all of these workers are vaccinated. And, and everyone, you know, a lot of the folks on this call actually from the mayor's office and so on, understand that we're working day in and night and day out on getting access to this vaccine to our members. Just over the weekend, I was in touch with many of you over issues that we have been finding in the distribution of vaccine. Everything from like social security number requests on forms to language access issues. This is just unacceptable. We need to get this vaccine to these workers because these are going to be amongst the first workers that are going to go out to work. And so we need to protect them and we need to make sure that this economic recovery is just. Um, and so there's a lot that we can do in partnership with the city. And you know, these groups are in some ways, you know, you know, we, we were meant for this kind of crisis as, as you know, some of my colleagues have testified. We've been doing this after hurricanes, after natural disasters. And so here we are, um, ready to continue to partner with the city. Thank you so much. Hi Thank everyone, um, Yesenia. I want to re reiterate exactly what everyone on this, um, on this panel just said. Throughout the pandemic, it has been centers like ours that have been assisting. Um, and it was a very interesting point what um, uh, uh, um, uh, Councilwoman Chen mentioned that we have been the personnel that has assisted our community with language access. That is something that our organizations don't get funding for. However, we have been doing that. We have been assisting our community, uh, being that liaison, and we have been doing this through COVID testing, through the COVID um, uh, vaccine distribution. Um, La Colmena was one of the first organizations here on Staten Island to start getting uh, members back, um, uh, giving access to to the vaccine, including like this weekend we took. Um, uh, domestic workers, day laborers, uh, hairdresser, dressers, restaurant owners to go and get um, the COVID uh, vaccine, and we started seeing that barrier too. It was, it was easier for us to get that because we have that access. It was easier for for La Colmena to get that because we were able to communicate with our members and the 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 personnel who was giving the the COVID vaccine. However, if we're not here, then who will then be reaching? to the immigrant workers for them to get vaccinated. And this is not just La Colmena doing here on Stein Island, but it's each center. And it has really taken a toll on each one of us. We have d definitely done the work that many elected officials have failed to do. And what we are now doing in is, is asking you all and that do not cut our funding because if we're not here, then who's going to be there to support the immigrant workers? We are equipped. We know how to do this type of work. We, we have this type of training and we are ready to assist the city uh, to recover. And as many have seen when there's snow, who's the first pe people out there? It's our day laborers doing the snow removal. That is what we show each time that our day laborers, that our centers are ready and they're equipped to assist the city in any sort of disaster and economic relief that they might need as well because we know how to reach out to our community. Thank you, Yesenia. And I'm gonna hand it over to uh, Council Member Chin. And just again, thank you to the reminder, the connection and the powerful force of the day labor centers. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. I wanted to really thank the first panel. And I also wanted to um, you know, celebrate International Women's Day. And it's really great to see so many women leaders uh, at the hearing today. I, I am just so, I could say proud I remember when we first started um, the day labor uh, centers. Um, it was one of the initiatives that the city council uh, pushed for and seeing it grow um, to citywide and, and the great work that all of you have done. And I think looking going forward, we have to see how we can institutionalize this in a way that it should be part of the city's funding. 
I mean, the city have workforce development center? Well, you guys are the workforce development center too. And you should be adequately funded. And what I'm talking about is baseline funding. If you're part of the city's infrastructure, which you should be, because council funding is every year and it's, it's just so difficult, but we need to stabilize it. And that's something I think chair, we need to really work towards that this should be part of the city's agency and the workforce development. And so we should look forward to see how we can help you so that you can get baseline funding to continue to do the great work that you do. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Chen. And, uh, and that is the plan. And I think you and I can really grow the revolution in the city council to ensure that that happens. So thank you to this panel. I'll hand it over to committee uh, council, Armani Oja. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm just going to quickly ask if there are any other council member questions for this panel. Seeing no hands, I'm going to thank this panel for their testimony and we'll be moving on to our next panel. Um, in order, I will be calling on Ira Yanquit, followed by Manal Jowd, followed by Yoon Ha Grace Lee, followed by Christine Kiel, followed by Christine Lee, followed by Iris Shri Chen, followed by Myung Hee Sung, followed by Ni Ok O. Ira Yankwe, you may begin your testimony when you are ready. Time starts now. Thank you, Chairman Chaka, for the opportunity to testify. My name is Ira Yankwit, and I'm the Executive Director of the Literacy Assistance Center. The LAC is a proud member of the New York City Coalition for Adult Literacy, and I'd like to take a moment on behalf of all the NICAL students, teachers, and programs to thank you for being the single greatest legislative champion for adult literacy in New York, and perhaps anywhere in the country over these past eight years. As you are well aware, as you are well aware, there are more than 2.2 million adults in New York City without English language proficiency or a high school diploma. Many of these New Yorkers have been on the front line of the pandemic performing essential work that has been sustaining our communities, often with little or no safety net. While adult literacy education is only one part of the solution, it will be essential to a fair, just, and sustainable recovery. Adult literacy education is an immigrant rights issue, a feminist issue, a racial justice issue, and an issue of educational justice. Higher levels of literacy are associated with greater health knowledge, use of healthcare services, and the ability to manage chronic health conditions and communicate with healthcare providers. Moreover, according to the National Institutes for Health, a mother's reading skill is the greatest determinant of her children's future academic success, outweighing other factors such as neighborhood and family income. Greater literacy skills are also great, directly linked to higher income. Yet, City and state funding for adult literacy education is so limited that fewer than 4% of the 2.2 million adults are able to access classes in any given year. So what do we need to do? First, the city must restore and baseline the $12 million in annual funds that the council secured in the budget every year from FY17 to FY20, and which were reduced to 9.8 .8 million in FY21. Second, we must ensure that every adult literacy student who needs it is provided with the necessary hardware and with free internet service to be able to access and engage in online educational platforms. No adult, no parent who would otherwise be able to participate in a basic education, ESOL or high school equivalency class should be the, denied the opportunity simply due to lack of basic infrastructure. Third, we call on the city to invest $10.5 million in the adult literacy pilot project that NICAL had proposed prior to the pandemic. The project would quadruple city funding for approximately 25 community-based adult literacy programs to support greater investment in student support services, digital literacy development, professional development, and contextualized curriculum and instruction, all of which have proven vital over this past year. And finally, we need to increase the total funding for adult literacy and education in New York City by sixfold over the next five years. Currently, the total state and city funding for adult literacy education amounts to approximately $85 million a year in New York City, less than $40 a year for each of the 2.2 million adults in need, and just over $1,000 for every student who's able to access classes. We need to work together to increase this funding to $500 million per year, both to serve far more than the 3 to 4% of the 2.2 million adults in need that we're currently serving, and to provide those students, their teachers, and their programs with the full range of resources and supports and benefits that they need and deserve. Thank you so much for your time and attention. 
Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Manal, Manal Jowd to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Hello, um, thank you. Uh, nice, uh, it's nice to meet you. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to testify. And uh, finally, happy uh, Women's Day. Uh, my name is Manal Jood. Um, I, uh, I, I man, uh, I am an ASL uh, student at City Tech College. I came to ASA uh, from, with my family from uh, two years ago. Uh, I didn't know anything about my new language, uh, anything, uh, some, uh, some simple grammars. Uh, our goal uh, uh, for us, like family here, uh, are to be uh, to get uh, uh, better education for me and for my children, and to get job uh, because I don't uh, want to be uh, uh, dependent uh, dependent on the government. So, what was uh, the solution? It was uh, learn English to help myself uh, in communicating um, uh, with the people and um, and help my children in their uh, studies. Uh, and their studies. And there, uh, there, uh, therefore, uh, they take me uh, as an example to be better and to serve this community. Now I'm doing it uh, at City Tech College. Uh, for adult education, uh, so I'll be happy uh, with my family uh, if you support and uh, and provide uh, funding uh, for adult education at my college. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome uh, Yoon Ha Grace Lee to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. I think we might be having some technical issues, so we'll circle back. Um, I'd like to now welcome Christine Yao to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Matt. Menchaka and members of the Committee in, on Immigration. My name is Christine Ho. I am currently taking English classes and Korean Community Services of Metropolitan New York Incorporated, KCS. KCS is a community social service nonprofit organization located in Bayside, New York. I am thankful that you have given me the opportunity to testify in front of you about the importance of adult literacy. A couple of years ago, I went to see a play in Central Park. Someone had brought me to see Shakespeare in the park, even though I could not fully understand the play since it was in English. I was able to enjoy the atmosphere, the audience, and the stage actors. Watching this play motivated me to start studying English. I realized that I wanted to study English to not also better understand the culture, but to also be able to communicate on, with my neighbors and have good relationships with my grandchildren. Studying English at KCS has allowed me to accomplish my goals. Last year was a difficult year for everyone, but even though through all the hardships and the sorrow, I was glad KCS offered English classes online. It helped me in a lot of ways and seeing my classmates' faces as well as my instructor's face really brightened my day and week. In closing, I'm thankful that the city council has supported students like me for a long time, and I hope that the council 
will continue to provide funding for adult literacy this upcoming fiscal year. Thank you again for giving me the opportunity to testify today. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now go back to Yunha Grace Lee to testify. You may begin when you are ready. I start now. Oh, good afternoon, Chairman Chaka and members of the Committee on Immigration. My name is Eun Ha Lee and I'm currently taking English class at Korean Community Service of Metropolitan New York. I'm grateful that you have given me the opportunity to testify about the importance of adult literacy. Prior to taking English class at KCS, I could only express my thoughts and feelings in simple sentences. Whenever anyone uh, would ask me more difficult questions, I would automatically become nervous and lose confidence. In order to overcome my fear and have deeper conversations with other people, I decided to enroll in English classes. Uh, taking English class uh, at Korea, uh, KCS has allowed me to improve my abilities in grammar, writing, speaking, and reading. Not only has it given me the confidence to speak with other people, but it has also helped me realize that my dream could become a reality because I taught the kids in Korea for 10 years before coming here. I have always wanted to start a daycare center. At first, I thought that my dream was impossible, but learning English has given me the confidence to start a daycare center one day. The daycare center that I would run would not only be for Korean kids, but for all ethnic groups. But in order for me to accomplish my goal, I would need to continue improving my English skills so that I'm able to talk with the parents that bring in their children and to my future staff members as well. Uh, thank you. Thank you again for giving me the opportunity to testify today. Thank you so much for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Christine Lee to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Can I start now? Uh, Ms. Lee, I'm sorry, I think you're muted. You you have to accept the unmute um, request. Good afternoon, Chair Menchaka and members of the committee on immigration. My name is Christine Lee, and I am also take, uh, currently taking English classes at Korean Community Service of Metropolitan New York. Uh, Christine Hale is my one of my classmates. I am grateful that you have given me the, the opportunity to testify in front of you about the importance of adult literacy. I used to take, uh, hesitate taking talking on the phone with my grand uh, with my daughters-in-law and grandchildren who only speak English. But taking English classes at uh, KCS has given me the confidence and the ability to freely communicate with them. I have also been thankful that I have been able to continue my classes online even throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. This has been a huge help since I suffer from depression. Being able to see my classmates and my teacher twice a week has given me great joy and has allowed me to appreciate the small things in life. I am extremely grateful to be studying English during difficult times like this, because it has not only helped me communicate with my family, but it has, it has also greatly helped my mental and physical health. In closing, I'm grateful that the city council has supported me, uh, supported the students like me for a long time. Thank you again for giving me the opportunity to testify today. Thank you again. 
Thank you for your testimony. Um, I'd like to now welcome Iris uh, Shri Chen to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Hi, good, mo good afternoon, um, Chair Machaco and the members of a Community on Immigration. My name is Irish Xu and I'm currently taking English class at the Korea Community Service of Manitoba, New York, KCS. KCS is a social service nonprofit organization located in Bayside, New York. I'm grateful that you have given me the opportunity to testify in front of you about the importance of adult in terrorists. Learning English has always been a challenge for me, but I have been grateful that I have the opportunity to improve my English by taking online classes at KCS, especially during the pandemic. Since we are stay home and are not going out anymore, being able to continue my class online has helped me in so many ways. Every morning when I wake up, I'm looking forward to my class. Since I'm able to see my instructor and my wonderful classmates. As a result, it has been a huge help to my mental health. One day, I hope to be able to communicate with other people without having any language barriers. I also hope that I will be able to give back to the community to help others through my improved skill English. In closing, I'm grateful that City Council have supported students like me for a long time. I hope that the concert will continue to provide funding to adult literary this coming up future year. Thank you again for giving me the opportunity to testify today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Myung Hee Sung to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Uh, Ms. Sung, your your audio is um, very low. I don't think we can hear you. I'm sorry, we're unable to hear you. Um, let me circle back to you. Um, I'm gonna move on to our next panelist. Can um, Mi Ok O, you may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Yes. Good afternoon, Chairman Chaka and members of the Committee on Immigration. My name is Miyok O. I am grateful to testify in front of you about the importance about, of adult literacy. In my opinion, I believe that in order for an immigrant to get adjusted to life in America, he or she need to learn how to speak English. So when I found out that KCS was offering English classes for free, I was excited that I would be able to learn the language. Not only have I been to get adjusted to my life in America, I have also been able to learn about American history, politics, and the culture throughout my classes. These topics have not only helped me understand the country that I am living in, but it has also given me the opportunity to connect with those who are around me. More immigrants like me need to learn about this program. And the only way that they will be able to participate in the classes is if there is continuous funding. In closing, I am grateful that the city council has supported students like me 
for a long time. And I hope that the council will continue to provide the funding for adult literacy this upcoming fiscal year. Thank you again for giving me the opportunity to testify today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for your testimony. Um, I'm going to circle back to mm -hmm. Myung Hee Sung. Um, I'm so sorry, Ms. Sung. I think your audio isn't working or your microphone isn't working. We're not able to hear you. Um, I uh, just want to remind everyone that um, you may submit written testimony at testimony uh, at NYC, excuse me, testimony at council.nyc.gov. Um, and we can try to circle back to you at uh, a later time if uh, you're able to resolve your audio issue. Um, I'd like to now turn it over to Chairman Chaka for questions. Thank you, Harbani. And I wanna say thank you to this panel uh, that really, I think in every way shows the power of voice. And each of you who have testified today have uh, really responded with the kind of action that our government, our local government should be taking to support your education and adult literacy at, to many of the points that Ira Yanquit made on behalf of the, the coalition, the larger adult literacy coalition has been making for years now is that there is powerful transformation for individuals, for families, for communities, for engagement, for jobs, for everything that the city is asking for. And so what we, what we wanna do is make the connection between language access for those who need immediate assistance to connect to services and then to support all of you in your endeavors for education, uh, including my mother, for example, that just because of her um, inability to have a class at the time that she needed to, when I was growing up, didn't have access to classes and so never got her high school equivalency uh, and never gained command of the English language. Uh, and so, so I, I hear you and I'm gonna continue to fight for you. And I think that uh, you have a partner, not just in me, but in this larger city council, including council member Chin, who I wanna hand it over to now for, for her comment and question. Thank you. Time starts now. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. And I really wanted to thank this panel. Uh, the testimony was great. It just illustrates the importance of learning English and how important it is for you to be able to communicate with your grandchildren, you know, with the teachers. It makes so much sense. And we've been fighting on this for so many years that for all immigrants, we want to learn English. Just give us the opportunity. And I, it just frustrates us, right, uh, Chair Manchaka, that every year we have to convince the administration that they need to support this. And Ira, we agree with you, the funding needs to be there. And it, it just makes so much sense. So I wish the mayor would have heard your testimony <laughs> uh, and for, to convince him why this is so important. So I urge you also to write to him, uh, call him, let him know that adult literacy is great and is so useful to you and to your community and to your family. And I just wanted to thank you and you know for sharing uh, your stories with us and you will make your contribution. And some of you are, are seniors and you will be volunteering, you will be helping, you will be contributing to the city because you are able to learn English. So I think this is something that we need to continue to advocate the resources for. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Chin, and, uh, and also start businesses. And so I hope you do start your daycare uh, business and we will be there to support. So thank you. I'll hand it back to Council uh, of the Committee, Arbani Oja. 
Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm just going to quickly ask if there are any other council member questions for this panel. Seeing no hands, I'm going to thank this panel for their testimony and we'll be moving on to our next panel. In order, I will be calling on Ravi Reddy, followed by Eric Agarijo, followed by Maya Gurung, followed by Lakshmi Sun. Sanmugan Nathan, followed by Sharanya Pillai, followed by Carlin Cohen. Um, Ravi, ready? You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Thank you so much. And I want to thank you for offering us the opportunity to speak here today. I'm Ravi Reddy, and I'm the Associate Director of Advocacy and Policy at the Asian American Federation. This year's budget must make a priority of supporting our immigrant communities and CBOs that have led by example in providing language accessible and culturally competent services to our 1.3 million strong Asian American community, two out of three of whom are foreign born and one in five of whom are undocumented. Firstly, the Asian American community has borne the brunt of the previous administration's immigration assault and are scrambling to find culturally competent, language accessible, affordable immigration legal advocacy. City Council should do its part and set aside $2 million for immigration legal services funding for not only CBOs with a track record of providing immigration legal services, but also the Asian CBOs who have provided language and navigation support in order to make these services accessible. And as our immigration community, all, uh, immigrant community also also bears a disproportionate burden of the basic need and security brought on by the pandemic, the city must also increase investment in safety net programs such as community health centers and clinics, food pantries, as well as an emergency network of linguistically and culturally competent food service programs. Our seniors and other vulnerable populations need to be connected to these alternative food benefits in order to begin to address the harm inflicted by the continued after effects of the previous administration's public charge assault. I want to thank Councilmember Menchaca for acknowledging the continued anemic funding our community has received for the substantial work our CBOs are doing to keep our community afloat. Asian New Yorkers comprise at least 10% of the population in more than half of our city's districts, with the other half having some of the fastest growing Asian populations. As City Council requires works on this year's budget, Council members must keep in mind the persistent inequities in city contracting practices and the systemic barriers facing our CBOs. Contracting processes must give greater weight to organizations with a demonstrated track record of serving low income, underserved immigrant communities with linguistic and cultural competency. And finally, language access. Our immigrants are facing, are facing continued immigration policy flux while navigating a pandemic that has disproportionately impacted their daily lives. That's why more than at any other time, there is a clear window of opportunity and urgency for a city council to finally fund a community legal interpreter bank as has been discussed, as well as fund worker co-ops that will focus on the recruitment, training, and dispatching of qualified interpreters and increasing job opportunities for multilingual immigrants with $250,000 per worker co-op for three co-ops covering Asian, African, and Latin American languages. The payoff from funding these initiatives will be seen in multiple ways, from providing employment opportunities in our immigrant communities to relieving strains on existing CBO capacity to provide interpretation, to addressing the serious gap in quality language interpretation for the communities that need it the most, not just for immigration purposes, but for accessing government assistance during a continued pandemic. The city must also make the FY. Uh, 2022 budget include funding such that local law 30 is fully and consistently implemented across city agencies, as has already been mentioned by council members. We understand cities in dire financial straits, but our immigrants have anchored our city and they deserve well-funded CBOs and robust responsive city agencies. We at the Asian American Federation, thank you for allowing us to testify and look forward to working with all of you to make sure our immigrant community gets the support it deserves. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Eric Agarijo to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Good afternoon and aloha. Uh, I'm originally from Honolulu, Hawaii. I uh, just want to start off the bat by mentioning that my name is Eric Agarijo. I am the Community Outreach and Communications Coordinator of the Korean American Family Service Center. Uh, thank you, Council Member Menchaka and members of the Council Immigration staffers for giving me this opportunity to speak before you. Um, I also like to recognize the longtime support of your consistent validation of the work KFC does in the community through the much needed Dove initiative and other programs um, that are offered. Uh, this initiative 
uh, was and continues to be critical to supporting our immigrant survivors of domestic violence, sexual assault, and child abuse. Um, as you folks probably already know, uh, KFSC is a nonprofit organization that provides social services to Korean and Asian immigrant survivors and their children who are affected by domestic violence, sexual assault, and child abuse for the past 32 years. All of our programs and services are offered in a culturally and linguistically appropriate setting. 98% uh, of our clients are immigrants and 100% of our staff members are immigrants themselves or children of immigrant parents. Over 95% of our clients' first language is not English and come from low-income backgrounds. Uh, unfortunately, during New York State on pause and throughout the COVID-19, public health and economic crisis, KFSC responded to a 300% increase in calls to our 24-hour bilingual hotline. 88% of these were related to domestic violence and sexual assault and child abuse. Uh, in 2020, we responded to over 4,000 hotline calls. And KFC served 1,201 survivors of domestic violence and sexual assault and provided over 20,908 services related to domestic violence and sexual assault. Uh, we want to keep in mind that many of our survivors are undocumented and are excluded from accessing unemployment insurance and all other income supports. Uh, they lost financial means, some temporarily, others permanently, Why resulting in loss of livelihood and unable to support themselves and their children. These consequences have ex exacerbated as they are ineligible for unemployment benefits and other labor protections by law from which they are excluded. Many in our community and their loved ones have contracted the virus and died. Without financial means, our immigrant survivors can't afford food, rent, basic necessities, personal protective equipment and supplies, medical care, or basic living expenses, phone, internet, utility bills, etc. cetera. Um, and we want to say that KFC, KFSC is at the front line serving our community and the constituents to fill the gap during this unprecedented trauma. The pathway to this recovery is long and hard, and we respectfully ask for the restoration or expansion of the budget for the fiscal year 2020, 2022. Initiatives like Dove Program, Immigrant Domestic Violence Initiative, an initiative to combat sexual assault, as well as both adult literacy and digital literacy initiatives, and other support will be critical for the sustainability of the organization as we provide the culturally and linguistical services and programs. And I wanna say thank you very much for allowing me to testify um, as we look forward to working with all of you. And on a side note, this is my first week in New York City and I've been working remotely in Honolulu, Hawaii. So I just wanna, hopefully I can bring that weather from Honolulu, Hawaii. So thank you very much. Thank you, Eric. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Maya Grung to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Uh, dear members of the Immigration Committee, uh, thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to testify today. My name is Maya Gurung and I'm the uh, Senior Case Coordinator at Adhikar. Adhikar is the only woman-led worker and community center serving and organizing the Nepali-speaking community. Uh, we are located in Woodside, Queens and serve more than 10,000 Nepali-speaking uh, people a year. Our members are low-wage workers working in uh, informal industries, mostly live in Jackson Heights, Woodside, Elmer, Sunnyside, Richwood, Jamaica, and Flatbush. Uh, we are one of the newer and most rapidly growing immigrant communities in New York City. Uh, we were once considered uh, the epicenter of the COVID-19 crisis when the pandemic first hit New York. Uh, this has had a severe impact in our community for the year and will change our community for the long term. Uh, we have served over 5,000 individuals with uh, direct service needs, addressing issues like unemployment, benefit support, healthcare, language access to government resources, and uh, emergency fund, medical and food supplies. Uh, at this moment, we are experiencing record high in, uh, inquiries related to immigration and workers' rights related issues, especially on the uh, temporary protected status, unemployment, and benefits vaccines, health uh, care, et cetera, and we will have to do this with or without funding. Our members with young children are running out of food at home and are fearful to return to work. Those that are finding themselves for, uh, forced to work or return to work are experiencing detrimental health and safety scrutiny. We are being flooded with needs and 
request and if we are to maintain sustainable and collectively work for these communities, the city must step in. We are our communities 911 and 311 line. We expect the need for legal services to rise in the coming years, especially if more immigrant friendly legislation is passed. Uh, without an in-house attorney, we will not be able to meet the demand for immigration related services. Currently, we rely on other legal service providers for any type of immigration related support. Uh, under this political climate, they are at maximum capacity and well, as well and are not able to provide us the urgent response that the case demands, especially given the virtual transition of our work. Additionally, uh, even when we refer out the cases, members often want us to interpret for them as many interpreters offered by government services do not interpret thoroughly or convey what our members is expressing. They also need emotional and supplementary support, which requires staff time and capacity. In FY 2021, uh, Asian-led and serving organizations received only 4.65% of city council discretionary dollars and less than 1.5% of social service contract dollars. Uh, there has been little support for the immigrant workers that are holding this city's economy on their backs, and we need to ensure that the city will show that immigrant communities are a priority by all allocating the resources needed this coming year. We are here today uh, to ask the committee to request uh, $50,000 from the Immigration Opportunities Initiative to provide critical immigration services to the Nepali-speaking community in New York City. Thank you for your time and your consideration for funding. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Lakshmi Sanmuganathan to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Good afternoon, City Council. I want to thank Chairman Manchaka and our distinguished members of the Committee on Immigration for your continued partnership and solidarity with our 15% and growing campaign. Um, my name is Lakshmi Shamaganathan. I am the policy fellow from the Coalition of Asian American Children and Families, which is the nation's only pan-Asian children and families advocacy organization. CACF also leads the fight for our 15% and growing campaign, which is the coalition that brings together over 45 Asian-led and serving organizations across all five boroughs of New York City to fight for a fair, inclusive, and equitable New York City budget. Our communities are heavily immigrant in nature with 78% of our uh, APA population in New York City being immigrants. Um, and the APA population is also the fastest growing um, group in New York City, nearly doubling every decade since 1970 and now making up more than 15% of New York City's population. Um, unfortunately though, current levels of public funding remain disproportionate to our community's expansive and growing population and needs. For example, last year, Asian-led and serving organizations only received 4.65% of discretionary dollars from city council. COVID-19 over the past year has also left a, dev a devastating impact on our APA communities by exacerbating challenges that already existed within the APA community in New York prior to the pandemic. For example, um, Asian Americans have experienced the largest increase of joblessness of all major racial groups in New York City with an unemployment rate of almost 26% in May of 2020. Nearly 50% of all APAs in New York City are living in the hardest hit areas during the pandemic. Asian Americans are two times more likely to test positive for COVID-19 than their white counterparts, yet less likely to get tested at all. Um, and over the past year, anti-Asian related hate crimes in New York City has increased by almost 2000% um, across all five boroughs. These rising challenges vary across our Asian Pacific American communities, but the one thing that they have in common is that they've all relied heavily oh. on our community-based organizations to fill in gaps of services to our vulnerable community members through linguistically and culturally competent services. So I'm here today on behalf of our coalition to ask that city council provide um, expanded funding to our community-based organizations so that they can continue to address the vital needs in our communities that are continuing to grow and expand amid the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Sharanya Pillai to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Hi, thank you. Thank you, Chairman Chaka and Chair Chin and the Committee on Immigration for helping India Home and our communities provide better services. I'm Sharanya Pillay, Deputy Director at India Home. 
India Home addresses the South Asian older adult immigrant community through culturally competent services. Our immigrant communities have faced exacerbated challenges, as you know, during this pandemic. Prior to the pandemic, New York City South Asian senior community faced a number of interconnected compounding issues, including the prevalence of poverty, overcrowded housing, low English proficiency, low digital literacy, and a lack of access to benefits. India Home has been the support for this community that has been lacking in the existing infrastructure by addressing these issues through our culturally competent services. This dedication continued during the pandemic through our culturally competent meals delivered to the safety of seniors' homes, virtual programming that kept seniors informed, engaged, and healthy, and wellness checkup calls that provided reassurance and connected seniors to crucial resources and programming during incredibly isolating times. I remember when one of our members, Dinesh Uncle, who called up our programming team and said, you are saving lives with your programs. These programs are not just recreation, but are wellness and health and safety and a lifeline to communities who are not adequately served in the city's existing infrastructure. Our programs have been far reaching during this pandemic with over 15,000 meals delivered to over 500 seniors, 1,200 grocery packages delivered, 300 plus virtual se sessions being given, including health education, yoga, exercise, ESL classes, and art classes, and 25,000 plus wellness checkup calls being given to our South Asian older adult community. Furthermore, we've provided robust COVID-19 awareness and outreach through which we have distributed over 20,000 masks to the hardest hit New York City communities, and now have made even more than 220 vaccine appointments for our seniors. The older adult community was the hardest hit during this pandemic, and this was especially the case for older adults of color. We saw this in our APA communities firsthand. We saw the losses in our communities. We saw the disruption and distress that shook our older adults in an unfair way, and we gave our thousand percent to make sure we can support them however we can. As our days of operation increased by more than 35 percent, and our staff has gone above and beyond to provide services and answer calls from our clients at all times of the day. The mayor's FY22 preliminary budget, this is a crucial moment for us to stabilize our community. Given budget cuts and extreme contract delays this past year, it has been an incredibly testing time for nonprofits that have been a lifeline for APA communities. We've powered through from the most vulnerable and it's time that we're recognized through a fair and equitable budget. Um, we ask for the enhancements of key citywide initiatives such as digital inclusion, literacy, mental health services for vulnerable populations and emergency food, food pantries, all which we provide but not have, have not been funded for in this last budget. And we emphasize importance of restoration to the Support Our Seniors Initiative, um, CCNSF, Senior Centers for Immigrant Populations, Geriatric Mental Health Initiative and Cultural Immigrant Initiative, among many others that'll help us stabilize the community. Um, we ask for equity and resource allocation and we thank you so much for your leadership in pushing the city budget and other various stakeholders for listening to our needs and concerns. Um, we request your continued and increased support to help us stabilize our communities. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Carlin Cohen to testify and may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Good afternoon. Thank you so much, Councilmember Menchaca, Councilmember Chin, and the members of the Immigration Committee for allowing us to testify today. My name is Carlin, pronouns they, them, and I'm with the Chinese American Planning Council, CPC. CPC serves over 60,000 Asian American immigrant and low-income New Yorkers each year. I want to uplift the asks of my partners at CACF, Asian American Federation, and the other panelists today, and add a little bit of what we've been seeing in our communities. Last year, I came before this committee and said that it was critical that we preserve funding for human services and for immigrant services because of everything we were seeing. And this year, I'm back before you to tell you that things have only gotten worse in our communities. Last year, I came and said that Asian American unemployment had grown 7,000% in just the first couple of months of the pandemic because we had seen in our communities that we had been hit before we went on pause uh, anywhere else. And this year we see that our community members are rationing food, standing in food lines that are ever growing and they haven't been able to pay bills. We've lost contact with community members who are not able to pay their cell phone bills or their internet bills because they don't have money. 
Last year, I came and said we needed additional funding for services because all of a sudden we were providing eviction prevention services, benefit enrollment services, helping people navigate unemployment. That is only getting worse. Our phones are ringing off the hook with need after need as community members continue to struggle without rental support, without unemployment support, and have been left out of city and state aid. Last year, I came and said we needed expanded funding for language access services because our community members were struggling to get information about COVID-19 testing and tracing, about how to get care and about best practices. This year, I come to you because our community members are still struggling with that information and because now vaccine access is inequitable because we cannot get information to people in the languages they need. We have become a pop-up vaccine navigator in addition to everything else we're doing. And last year, I came to you and said that community-based organizations need additional funding because we were having to navigate all of these programs for our community and I'm expired and change our programs to follow remote guidance. And this year I'm coming before you because we are seeing continuing ongoing need while our program funding has been cut, while we've had to lay off staff and while our staff have been exhausted working overtime trying to serve the needs of our community members which are only ongoing. It is critical that we fund all of these initiatives and increase funding for immigrant services for our community members. No specific initiative is enough because we need funding for all of these programs. And I reject the idea that this year is a tight budget because while human services and immigrant funding has been cut, we've seen that somehow the city has found money to hire 900 additional new cops to put more cops in our schools. We need funding for our communities to serve our community members not to police them, and it's critical that we have it this year. Thank you for your testimony. I'm now gonna turn it to Chairman Chaka for any questions. Thank you uh, to this panel. Uh, really in highlighting the need for continuing the organizational work on the ground and everything that you have taken on in this pandemic. We are not out of this pandemic in any way. Uh, our, our road to recovery is still in crisis mode. We, we need you all to keep doing the good work. And so I hope that in this hearing, and you'll have my, my commitment as chair, and you have members of this committee to continue to tell this story across the membership in the city council. It is on us as the city council, as a city council that votes on this budget to bring these issues to the forefront and to be, be able to build the budget lines that are necessary for all of these programs. And now is the time. So thank you so much. And for linking it to, um, and Carlin specifically, to, to really link it to the idea that we are, we are spending money, we are funding other things while we defund uh, these critical services. And so we can actually make that change. And the city council has the power to do that. Uh, council member Chen. Time starts now. Thank you, Chair. I also want to thank this panel. Um, and I think it's also very critical for you to also reach out uh, to other council members, especially council members district that, that you are helping their constituent so that we have broader support, not just in the budget negotiation team, but across all council members, because you are in all their district and they need to hear from you and to hear the good work that you are doing. So we, the council will have a stronger voice um, to advocate with, you know, with the mayor to make them make sure that he puts money um, into these cr critical program. And that will also help us with our uh, city council respond. So I, I really encourage you to, uh, you know, submit your testimony, call those council members off it, send them, you know, cards, send them letters, make sure that they are aware of the work that you do. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Chin. And, uh, and, and I just wanna add as well that, that um, the budget negotiation team has, has yet to meet uh, since the last budget. And so that's something that we're gonna need support from the community as well to send that message to the speaker um, and to the finance chair to really bring the BNT back into work so that we can build on these ideas and actually engage uh, and, I would, I'm asking for support from all of you to ensure that that's something that you also ask for so we can do the work internally. And I'll hand it back to Council Committee Harbani Ahuja. 
Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd like to just ask if any other council members have questions for this panel. I'm not seeing any hands, so I'd like to thank this panel for their testimony. I'd like to, we're going to move on to our next panel. Um, in order, I will be calling on Ellen uh, Pecnanda, followed by Sarah Derry Oshiro, followed by Hassan Shifakala, followed by Jody Zeismer, followed by Terry Lawson. Um, Ellen Pacnanda, you may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Hi, thank you. My name is Ellen Pacnanda. I'm a supervising attorney in the New York Immigrant Family Unity Project at Brooklyn Defender Services, known as BDS. I want to thank this Committee on Immigration, in particular Chair Manchaka, and also everyone who has testified before us in allowing us to be an audience for all the wonderful work that all these organizations are doing for our city. And I appreciate the opportunity to testify today about our budget needs to serve the immigrant community in New York City. Brooklyn Defender Services has a multi-unit immigration practice, which works to minimize the negative immigration consequences of criminal charges for non-citizens represent our clients in immigration applications for immigration benefits, and to defend our clients against ICE detention and deportation. As you know, we are one of the three NIFA providers. We provide affirmative non-detained immigration legal services through our IOI-funded immigration community action program, and our Padilla criminal immigration specialist provides support and expertise on criminal and family cases involving non-citizens. We echo the needs that our colleagues from Legal Aid and Bronx Defenders will highlight. And in my time, I will speak a, about the work that our NIFAP teams have accomplished during the pandemic. As this committee is well aware, NIFAP is the nation's first ever universal representation program for detained immigrants facing deportation. It has been a model of access to justice nationwide and has inspired replication in many states and cities that wanna stand beside their immigrant communities. There are now 18 cities and states that have committed public dollars to deportation defense with NIFAP remaining the gold standard in the model. As the pandemic raged in our city in 2020, ICE continued to detain hundreds of New Yorkers in detention facilities where COVID-19 spread rapidly. Because of the council's commitment to legal services, BDS and our partners were able to respond quickly. In an around the clock team effort to free at risk clients from dangerous ICE I'm detention sorry. conditions, BDS filed federal litigation challenging detention in the COVID era in nearly 60 cases for 85 separate clients. In March 2020, BDF staff won the groundbreaking Basank v. Decker decision, freeing 10 people with serious health risks from life threatening detention. The first decision in the nation finding ICE deliberately indifferent to the safety of detained people. BDS shared our resources with other attorneys and worked with the Legal Aid Society and Bronx Defenders to file case after case throughout 2020, fighting for the liberty of the people we represent. In total, the three NIFAP offices have won the freedom of over 240 NIFAP clients from March 2020 until now. We ask that the City Council continue funding NIFAP to allow us to retain our flexibility to address crises and remain in intake at the detained and immigration court throughout the year. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Sarah Derry Oshiro to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Sarah Derry Oshiro, and I'm the Managing Director of the Immigration Practice at the Bronx Defenders. Um, I'd like to thank the Council for its consistent support of NIFAP and um, explain why our request for level funding for our program is more important than ever before. Um, I'm going to just highlight the ways in which the advocacy of our program has continued to be vitally important for New Yorkers who are at um, double risk of deportation and of um, becoming sick during the pandemic. Um, while many court, system paused, court systems paused during the pandemic, the deportation machine kept moving forward um, without stopping. Detained courts never closed. So um, there have been cases moving through the system at the Varick Street Immigration Court 
even though preparing our clients remotely has been incredibly challenging given the risks that um, visiting them in jails uh, carries and given the technical and practical difficulties that commuting, communicating via video conferences with the, our clients in jails presents for um, the program. Um, I also just want to note that most of the uh, laws and policies from the previous administration are actually still in effect today. Um, and these legal obstacles make all of our client advocacy more challenging and time consuming, since the pathways to a successful legal outcome are still blocked in large part by the barriers that were erected by the Trump administration. Um, and this is particularly true for our clients who are seeking political asylum, um, and they continue to be stymied by the restrictive laws that were put in place over the previous four years. So programmatically, the persistence of these legal obstacles means that our staff must litigate cases through lengthy appeals processes in many, many instances, um, and that just hasn't changed in, in this past year. Um, and even if President Biden rolls back some of the worst abuses of the Trump era and reverts to, uh, for example, policies from the Obama era, we want to remain mindful that we saw record Time detentions expired. and deportations under the Obama presidency. Um, and so just going back to the status quo is not a solution for us and for our clients. Um, and uh, with the deportation moratorium that was put in place early on in this administration blocked by a federal judge in Texas, the need for NAFEP representation is greater than ever before. Um, I lastly just want to flag that we have had to keep up with the changes at the non-detained immigration court on a week by week basis for the entirety of this pandemic and there's really no end in sight and we're unable to plan for um, these the, the ways in which this court may or may not reopen at any point in time. So we are constantly litigating cases at the non-detained courts, even though the trials keep getting postponed. Um, so the advocacy continues on um, more now than ever before. And we hope that we are able to continue to offer our critical services um, with level funding in this next fiscal year. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Hassan Shafikala to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Hey, good afternoon. My name is Hassan Shafikala. I'm the attorney in charge of the Immigration Law Unit at the Legal Aid Society. And thank you to the chair, um, person Manchaka and all the other council members. I'm gonna address NIFAP and echo a little bit of what my colleagues from Bronx Defenders and Brooklyn Defenders have said. And I'll also touch on eye care um, for unaccompanied minors and a little bit about the Immigrant Opportunities Initiative or IOI. So although, so starting with NIFAP, although ICE raids have been lower during the, over the past year than they have been before, it seems likely that detention numbers will start to go back up as things begin to return to normal and as things start to reopen. And this would include NIFAP clients for whom we have won release during the pandemic. As Ellen mentioned, we've secured the release of over 240 people since the, since the lockdown began in, on March 16th of last year. And it's possible that ICE could try to re-detain them claiming that the jails are now safe again, although the jails were never safe even before COVID. And we've had ongoing issues with substandard conditions in all the ICE jails. We need to be able to continue fully staffing our NIFAB teams um, in response to whatever ICE will do. Um, because even if the Biden administration is able to roll back um, the enforcement priorities you know, to how they were before Trump, under Obama, things were not great. We had more people deported under any president before until we get to Trump. And so just going back to the status quo ante is not any relief for our clients. They're going to be at continued risk of detention and deportation. And so the need for NIFAP funding is as great as ever. So we call upon the, the council to fully fund the three NIFAP providers at the same level that we had last year. The southern border is seeing an influx in, in families and young people um, coming expired. in again. 
And so for the eye care collaborative of which Legal Aid is a part, we're asking the council to fully fund all the eye care providers. Um, we're going to need continued support from the council to meet the need that we're going to be feeling here in New York as people who come in through the southern border make their way here as they did in 2014 um, to now with the surge of young people. And then finally, um, the Immigrant Opportunities Initiative has been, you know, it's a baseline program, um, and we call on the city to allow it to be as flexible as possible based on what we might see coming out of the administration this year. Maybe we'll have the DREAM Act. Maybe we'll have either temporary protected status or deferred enforced departure for Venezuela. Maybe Congress will surprise us and actually give us comprehensive immigration reform. But whatever happens, we're going to need flexibility under all of our immigration contracts to pivot to meet the need um, so that we're most able to help the, the community. Because if they're able to get any of these sort of statuses, they will no longer be, presumably, will no longer be um, vulnerable to removal. And so it, it really behooves the city to support us in, in meeting um, what may be you know, a short window of opportunity to get people status. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Jody Zeismer to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Yes, hi, Chairperson Manchaka, Council Members. Good afternoon and thank you for this opportunity to testify. My name is Jody Zeismer. I'm the Director of the uh, Immigrant Protection Unit at the New York Legal Assistance Group, or NILAG. Um, I would like to touch upon three priorities for funding legal services. First, the rapid response, legal collaborative and work Second, the preparing for universal representation for all immigrant New Yorkers in removal proceedings. And finally, restoring funding for the key to the city program. Um, in my written testament, I go through some statistics. I'm not gonna belabor those um, at this point since many of my uh, fellow panel members have touched on them, only to say that you know, immigration enforcement and deportation and detention continues and is still a major issue separating our immigrant community members from their families. As Commissioner Mustafi mentioned, the City Council has been instrumental and generous in funding the Rapid Response Legal Collaborative, and we've used that funding to respond to the changing landscape due to the pandemic and enforcement priorities. The need to maintain this funding at current levels is paramount. The Rapid Response Legal Collaborative, which is a collaborative comprised of NILAG, Make the Road, and Unlocal, was instrumental in responding to the pandemic and conditions in detention centers. We received uh, more than 400 referrals in 2020, and we were able to serve uh, 281 people. We filed numerous parole requests for detainees with medical conditions and suffering from the effects of COVID in detention centers. We represented 12 individuals in habeas petitions to obtain their release. Rapid response cases are exceedingly complex and time consuming. We take cases of people who are already have deportation orders. Um, and this requires experienced attorneys who are equipped to bring cases in federal and circuit courts. Um, in addition to taking on this urgent work, our team has inspired trained and mentored attorneys um, in New York and nationally. Um, I'm just going to also quickly make a pitch for um, this uh, to follow on what Hassan said about funding the IOI initiative and expanding that um, to really look towards universal representation. There are two pending pieces of legislation, one in the state of New York and one um, nationwide, which would provide universal representation for um, the many people in removal proceedings. Right now, there are 284,000 New York City residents who are in active removal proceedings. Um, 14,000 of those cases were filed since the pandemic started. So we see that you know, ICE has in, in, continued to place people in this position. And I think New York has a real opportunity to um, create models and programs that could address a universal representation model if, that, if legislation does pass. And then finally, I'll just say that in 2020, unfortunately, the city council um, cut the key to the city program. This has been a longstanding collaboration between the New York Immigration Coalition and NILAG to provide large scale screening, information clinics, and know your rights presentations. Um, 
located in communities. This is going to be essential to restore the funding for that program so that we can disseminate information and do screening intakes and simple application preparation for people who may benefit from some of the programs that Hassan mentioned um, and any reform that comes. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Terry Lawson to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Terry Lawson and I'm the executive director of Unlocal. I'm also the co-founder and steering committee member of the Bronx Immigration Partnership. I'm here today to ask the city council to expand funding for immigration legal services, community education, outreach, and organizing. Unlocal provides free, high quality legal services for New York's most vulnerable immigrants, many of whom are essential workers or ineligible for benefits as many have testified today, who are seeking employment authorization, asylum, DACA, SIG, lawful permanent residency, relief from removal, and so much more. Last year, Unlocal's legal team handled 1,000 cases for people across New York City and in parts of Long Island and upstate. Our Queer Immigrant Justice Project works with LGBTQ plus immigrants who are seeking asylum. And the director of that project, Michael Yonker, was just named one of the best LGBTQ plus lawyers under 40 by the National LGBT Bar Association. As my uh, colleague at NILAG just mentioned, Unlocal is part of the Rapid Response Legal Collaborative along with Make the Road. And the lawyers, paralegal and social worker who serve on our Rapid Response team have been fighting tirelessly during this pandemic to stop deportations and get people out of detention where their physical and mental health are threatened every day. Our rapid response work shows just how entangled ICE and law enforcement are and continue to be despite the efforts of advocates and community members to explain to the city lawmakers how local policing feeds the deportation pipeline. We have been raising the alarm about the dangers and continued harms of city officials collaborating with ICE by telling the story of one of our clients, Javier Castillo Maradiaga, a 27 year old Bronx man who came here when he was seven and was turned over to ICE by this city. Over the past year, our education outreach team has been busier than ever, partnering with 140 community-based organizations and schools throughout the city, hosting monthly partner calls on rapidly sorry. changing law and policy and conducting 68 community events, 47 of which were virtual, that reached 8,000 attendees and posting online resources in wide ranging topics such as DACA, stimulus relief, unemployment, taxes, the census and more. We recognize that only by providing accurate up-to-date information are we able to counteract the predatory practices of those taking advantage of the confusion and anti-immigrant rhetoric that pervades our culture. Under the new administration, laws and policies continue to change at a dizzying pace and our education and outreach team keeps the public informed about these changes and their impacts on immigrant New Yorkers. In an era where the Biden administration continues to deport people, as my colleagues have stated, with 70 removal flights in February alone, detaining asylum seekers in so-called migrant facilities and but also simultaneously increasing avenues for affirmative immigration relief, we call on the city to expand funding for immigration legal services and community education. We ask the city to council to continue to support the Immigrant Opportunities Initiative and to expand funding to allow additional legal services providers to partner with the city to provide vital services for our clients and community members. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your testimony. Um, I'm gonna now turn it to Chairman Chaka for questions for this panel. Thank you, thank you Harbani. And thank you to the fearless leaders of our knife up I care uh, initiatives. You know, if you think about what the council has done in the last seven years, with the incredible leadership of the council itself uh, and this committee, we've been able to increase the legal services across across the board and and really even fight for and win IOI baselining mm -hmm. for services. Now, my question to all of you, and, and maybe I can pick a couple of you uh, to start the conversation, but I wanna really get to the heart of this question, which is expansion of legal services and the, the creation of a flexible set of contracts, both at the city council, which I think we do, we have met your needs in terms of flexibility, 
on council funded yearly, not the baseline stuff, and then asking for that same flexibility with the baseline. And so I guess my question, uh, and maybe we can start with, with Hassan, the has the administration begun conversations with all of you about that flexibility as they understand what's going on with the possible federal uh, yet to materialize promises from a Democrat president um, and 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 the things that the city needs to do to be ready to support families as those changes happen or they don't. And so have you started those conversations with the administration as a team for knife up? For IOI, for eye care, et cetera. So hi. So I'll so I'll start and then I'll let my colleagues um, join in as well. So I'm happy to report that both um, from Moya and HRA have gotten signals that they are open to um, flexibility um, to meet whatever need comes up. At this point, it's all very, you know, it's initial because we don't know what's gonna happen, if anything, given the, the gridlock in, in Congress. Um, but you know it's likely that something might happen for for Venezuelan TPS or DED or other things. And both Moya and HRA have, you know, like I said, have signaled an openness to to being flexible with with our contracts. Okay, that's great. So we want to join you in that in that push and that advocacy. and and I think it should it should be part of our statement, our budget statement. Um, is anyone else want to add new information about that kind of flexibility, how how um, structured is the request at this point that we could learn about and support you. Okay. Um, but what I will just say is when things do get announced, we'll have to move very quickly. And so the more nimble, you know, we can be, um, you know, the better just because I think we'll have a relatively short window of time before applications start and, and we'll need to like ramp up pretty quickly to, to meet whatever the need may be. So, and, and, and I guess what I want to push, push on is, do we wait to be reactive to a federal government that is still figuring itself out? Or do we create a, a proactive stance and say, we have to rethink how the, the changing, uh, infrastructure for the federal government and all the dollars that we're putting in to, to support New Yorkers in civil, these are civil immigrant uh, court cases. How, how are we thinking through that? And can we be proactive? And is that something that you're all asking for? Yes, I I'll, think- I'll keep, is, go ahead, Jody. Well, I think this is a real opportunity. Like IOI funding is wonderful in that it's very broad and there's not a lot of um, requirements with it, which allows us potentially to represent all of the non-detained people in front of the immigration court. But there are an overwhelming number of those people. And I think that if we're looking towards universal representation or even you know, carving away at some of the um, some of those numbers, really providing as many people with legal advice and guidance, as well as representation as possible, that there is room for some other programming and some, um, you know, initiatives, some innovative initiatives um, that can really talk, develop other models besides just a one-on-one, -on -one, one attorney to one client representation model. Got it. Thank you, Jody, for, for that. And I think that's part of this larger flexibility. How can we build the contracts to allow you for not just flexibility and response, but to build new new apparatus, new government funded support for the on the ground work that all of you are doing. Um, okay, I, I guess what I wanna do is, is just say, just for the sake of time is if we can get on, on, a, on another call just to really understand how we can articulate the need and the, the sense of expansion for funding and the flexibility that you need now uh, for, for really anticipating all of the possibilities that we can get from Congress, which is more gridlock, Obama 2.0, uh, and, and just again, just the failed promises that are, are, are coming even now from this administration. And so with that, I will hand it over to Councilmember Chin. Time starts now. 
Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to really follow on what Chairman Chaka said. Um, we have to get ready and and also really be. I, I just want to really say, you know, it's, it's positive that we have we're we're optimistic that good things will be coming, and we need to prepare to really help um, our immigrant um, neighbors. And the question that I want to ask is that. In, in New York City, right, in the council, we are the one that started this initiative with the advocacy organization. And, but at a certain time, the administration needs to take over. It needs to be part of the city's infrastructure. I mean, we're happy that, you know, some of the IOI funding got baseline. But what I wanna ask some of you is like, what are the other programs that you are doing that can, um, become uh, a regular city program that should be funded by the administration. And so that this give you know, the council that we could start other new initiatives. You know, we started the great idea and the city, when it's working, the city needs to take over. So if you can like give us some idea, like what we should be advocating uh, to be baseline, to be part of the, the city's infrastructure in terms of legal services, thank you. Thank you, Council Member Chin. I just want to ask if there are any other council members that have questions at this time. Okay, seeing no hands, I'd like to thank this panel for their testimony and we're going to be moving on to our next panel. In order, I will be calling on Mario Russell, followed by Melissa C. Peterson, followed by Jojo Anobil, followed by Alexandra Rizzio, followed by Mia Soto, followed by Maggie Wong, followed by Mon Yakyu. Mario Russell, you may begin your testimony when you are ready. Time starts now. Thank you, uh, Council Member Menchaca and members of the City Council Committee on Immigration. Thank you, uh, Chair and uh, Council, Councilwoman Chin. I'm very grateful to be here. My name is Mario Russell. I'm the Director of Immigrant Refugee Services for Catholic Charities here in uh, New York. And I'm just here very briefly to, to touch on a range of subjects uh, and, and issues that Catholic Charities addresses um, from day laborer work to legal services, to unaccompanied minor services, to literacy issues, ESL issues, uh, IOI, I care, and the list is long. So I, I, I just simply exhorting the council to, to know that our work in a sense touches it across a number of the panels that have been before you today. What I wanna really touch on therefore, inclusive of these ideas is really how much COVID-19 has uh, affected all of our brothers and sisters who are in these communities and areas in which we serve um, an effect that is and will be harsh, disproportionate and lasting. Uh, we've been in this work for over 70 years and our division now uh, serves close to 30,000 immigrants and refugees each year through these range of services, whether it's refugee resettlement, detention assistance, integration, um, clinical work, family reunification, court representation, and of course legal at the deepest and broadest levels. And then obviously our information and hotline referral services where we field about 86,000 calls a year. Um, the pandemic forces to retool, re-engineer, rewire, and this job is not at all finished. You know, we distributed over $5 million in cash assistance um, and about three and a half million meals just in the New York City area alone. Our experience leading up to and during the pandemic um, was really how much our, our, our clients and the communities we work with reported anxiety, distress, you know, uncertainty, instability in so many areas of, of life. And understanding that this is as much existential as it is legal, as it is about income, as it is about food insecurity, um, as it is about status and security. And, and I would simply offer that the Trump administration's own assaults and incredibly toxic you know, onslaught of rhetoric 
and, and social violence really created almost a pre-existing condition that the pandemic then uh, burrowed into and affected. Um, so that by the time the pandemic arrived in March, our clients were already in a sense, in a weakened and much more vulnerable state. So it's for these reasons that we particularly urge the city today to renew its spending commitments, um, and particularly in two important areas, legal defense for unaccompanied children, the eye care project, um, and, and generally integration assistance. You know, I wanna simply answer a little bit of what uh, council uh, member Chin's question in the previous panel is, what do we need? You know, council member, we need more, more case management. Um, we need more mental health assistance. We need to understand that the 9 million or 11 million, but the 1 million in New York who are waiting for change are essentially the refugees whom we assisted 30 years ago. And there's no reason why they shouldn't receive the same transitional support, the same mental health supports, the same housing supports, the same economic supports, the same, again, case management assistance that, that refugees have historically received and continue to receive. So I think that's a space where the council could look at what's being done. Um, and in a sense, that's what the day labor centers do, right? But we can do more of that and broaden that piece. So with that, I'll simply say thank you. Um, you know, I wanna call on the council again to, to renew and to be partners with us in the patient, but the very, very real work of integration, of welcome and of building what is a just and compassionate society this time of crisis, especially to remind you of this very, very sacred work and thank you for your support. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, I'd like to now welcome Melissa C. Peterson to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Good afternoon and thank you to the committee for this opportunity to be heard. My name is Melissa Peterson and I'm a supervising attorney at The Door. The Door is a comprehensive youth development organization which has been supporting vulnerable youth in the city since 1972. We received city council funding through our work with the I Care Coalition. And with that funding, the door represents nearly 200 immigrant children and youth facing deportation each year. In addition to providing legal representation, um, our social workers support our young people and connect them to much needed resources. The young people we serve are among those who have been hit the hardest in the wake of the pandemic. One such woman named Maria lives in a shelter in the Bronx with her three-year-old daughter, Anna. Maria is pregnant with her second child and, ex and experiencing health complications. Maria and Anna fled to the US in 2019, seeking protection from domestic violence and death threats in their home country. In early 2020, they were ordered deported. At the height of the pandemic, we reopened both of their cases in immigration court and filed applications for asylum and special immigrant juvenile status. Unless Maria is granted asylum, she must wait for two to three years as a special immigrant juvenile before she can apply for a green card. During this time, she will have no authorization to work, no social security number, and no access to financial aid and other important benefits. And because of recent changes under the Trump administration, she's at risk of deportation despite her status. The door is involved in nationwide advocacy to promote, to promote meaningful changes in legislation and policy that would directly impact our young people like Maria, who are at risk of deportation. Without funding through eye care, our office would be unable to continue doing such important work. The eye care coalition is losing private funding and the continued economic support from city council is therefore imperative in keeping Maria, Anna, and nearly 200 other young people Time in New York expired. City safe from deportation each year and ensuring they are supported during this time of crisis. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Jojo Anobil to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Um, good afternoon, Chairman Chaka. My name is Jojo Anobil. And I'm the executive director of Immigrant Justice Corps. We're a fellowship program, one of its kind in the country. And we mobilize young lawyers and college graduates to provide assistance to legal, to, to immigrants. Um, first of all, let me applaud this committee for protecting and supporting immigrants this past four years. 
it was very imperative that we had that support. And because of that support, we have also been able to help immigrants. Let me say that we are trying to recover from four years of repressive policies and anti-immigrant rhetoric. Let me also say that we are not out of the woods yet. We know we have a broken immigration system, but the Trump administration also broke down the processes, the systems that are in place. Our immigration courts are broken. There are nearly 1.4 million cases pending. There are about 141,000 cases in New York alone. Our staff is extremely burdened with cases that are not closing. We haven't closed cases in the past year, cases that now are still on our docket. We expect a flood of families with children from the border, at least 20, 20 to 25% of probably a population of 25,000. There are new initiatives coming. When we talk about flexibility and pivoting to do extra work, let's be very clear. We have so many cases right now that when we pivot, it's not pivoting with the same staff and with the same resources. We are pivoting with additional resources because we have cases sitting there. We still need people. We still have clients that we are serving. So Time when expired. we talk about pivoting, let's talk about expanding resources and funding to be able to do that. Also, Mario had mentioned something about wellness, mental health. Mental health is two ways, both for our clients and for our staff. Our staff have been traumatized, not just by the pandemic, but also by how challenging the work has been. Therapy sessions cost a lot of money. Healthcare providers only give you two shots or three shots. And our staff are paying for some of these things out of pocket. We need to be able to help them be able to do this work. And so as we come to you this afternoon, yes, we are open to having further conversations. I just want to say thank you for supporting us. Thank you for helping us protect immigrants. We are here to work with you. There's a lot of work to be done. I also want to ask you to lend your voice to what is happening in Washington today and tomorrow and the day after. This city is in a unique position because you've been at the forefront of helping immigrants. You've put a lot of money behind this effort. This is a time for you to lend your voice to a humane reform system, to lend your voice to what happens with immigration, a humane system that just not, doesn't deport everybody or makes everyone a priority for deportation. We've seen what the pandemic can do. No one should be left in the shadows. Leaving people in the shadows is a risk to all our communities. Let's make sure that that does not happen. Thank you so much. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Alexandra, Alexandra Rizzio to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Thank you to the Committee on Immigration for convening this hearing and for inviting us to speak. My name is Alexandra Rizzio and I'm a managing attorney at the Safe Passage Project, a nonprofit legal services organization that provides free representation to immigrant children facing deportation. We serve children who live in the five boroughs of New York City and the two counties of Long Island. The support of the city of New York has been instrumental in our work. No immigrant, as you know, not even a child is appointed a lawyer in immigration court. If a child cannot afford to hire a lawyer, they will be forced to defend themselves alone against a trained government prosecutor and a judge with, deport with deportation back to dangerous conditions as the likely outcome. Safe Passage Project helps correct this injustice by providing free attorneys to kids. Beyond legal services, our social work team addresses the broader needs of clients, such as school enrollment, homelessness, access to healthcare, psychological services, and public benefits. As I mentioned, the City Council has been a stalwart support that allows us to fight on behalf of young immigrants. You fund our work through the Unaccompanied Minors Initiative and the IOI grant stream. Without your unwavering support, which we've had since 2014, we would not have been able to serve the over 1,200 clients that Safe Passage serves. 
In fact, the City Council's support for the Eye Care Collaborative is groundbreaking on a national level and has shown that local initiatives that support universal representation for immigrants, essentially filling a gap where the federal government refuses to act, is not only possible, but successful. Thank you. The COVID-19 pandemic has laid bare and heightened many of the inequalities in our system. Undocumented immigrants may work in essential jobs, but most lack job security, are less likely to have health insurance, and can be hesitant to seek emergency medical treatment. To compound these problems, undocumented immigrants have been deliberately excluded from most economic recovery programs. At the same time, our immigration work didn't stop. Filings still had to be made on time, kids were still being entered into removal proceedings, and they needed- Time expired. Since the first cases of COVID-19 were reported in New York City, our social work team has worked to connect young people with essential resources, including food, housing, and medical help. In response to the urgent needs of our clients, Safe Passage launched an emergency cash, response, cash assistance program in April 2020. Over the course of the year, we distributed $40,000 in assistance to 130 households. Our social work team has made more than 500 referrals to an array of resources, including client, connecting clients to mental health, medical health, uh, medical health, health insurance, food assistance, and shelters. Um, we likewise continued the struggle on the immigration front. We've conducted legal intake screenings for 285 clients since April 2020, filed hundreds of applications and motions. The deportation machine never stopped, so our teams worked tirelessly to ensure that our clients are protected. Funding for organizations like ours is never guaranteed, but the need for services is greater than ever. The Eye Care Collaborative was very successful in ensuring that New York's, New York's child immigrants are represented in court, but the Robin Hood portion of the funding from this public-private partnership is coming to a close. We recognize that these are very uncertain times, particularly from a budgeting perspective, but I ask the city council continue to elevate the need for these services. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Mia Soto to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chair Fersen Mancheca and the committee members for giving me the opportunity to present testimony today and for really this tremendous assistance. My name is Mia Soto and I'm the committee organizer in the Health Justice Program at the New York Lawyers for the Public Interest where we work to really ensure that undocumented immigrants have access to healthcare services in New York City. During this unprecedented public health crisis, I urge the council to support renewed funding for the Immigrant Health Initiative, which has saved lives and improved health across the city. New York Lawyers for the Public Interest is privileged to be part of the city council's Immigrant Health Initiative, and we thank you for that support. At a time when access to medical care and information is crucial and misinformation can really endanger our communities, this support has allowed us to expand our work, educate immigrant New Yorkers with serious health conditions, their healthcare providers, and of course, legal service providers about how to access healthcare barriers and how to stay safe during this pandemic. You know, the Immigrant Health Initiative funding has also supported greatly NILFI's work seeking to improve access to healthcare services in immigration detention facilities. And with your support, we have also been able to provide comprehensive um, screenings and legal representations to individuals, particularly those who are in serious and who are and who have serious healthcare conditions, um, including holistic support. Uh, for individuals in terms of providing information um, to, to, of course, for financial assistance, food banks, housing relief, and to really meet the intersecting needs of our client community. And additionally, with your support, you have also allowed us to support eligible immigrants uh, to enroll in state-funded Medicaid, which, of course, improves access to Medicaid, has had lives changing, and often Time lives... Expired. Thank you, thank you again. And today I ask that funding continues in for the year 2022 for both NILPI and our community partners. We look forward to continuing our work to improve New, Yorker, New Yorkers access to healthcare services. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Maggie Wong to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Hi. Uh... 
Thank you, uh, Chair Machakar. Thank you, uh, Councilwoman Chen, and also uh, Immigration Committees and for the opportunities. My name is Maggie Wong. I'm from the Charles B. Wong Community Health Center. Uh, we are qualified house, uh, qualified, qualified health center, and we have site in Manhattan and Queens. We provide uh, primary care services uh, to medically underserved uh, population, including immigrants, underinsured, and underinsured uh, limited English profession, uh, foreign born Asian American who living in New York City. Regarding, regarding of immigration status, language they speak or ability to pay. Uh, during the pandemic, uh, we continue to open seven days a week uh, as, a, um, as a, and then now we are in the midst of the COVID-19 uh, pandemics. The challenges are greater, but we continue to bridge the critical gaps to accessing high quality healthcare in the community through uh, COVID testing, uh, COVID vaccinations, um, as an echo to uh, Councilwoman Chin just mentioned that we expand our outreach through radio programs, TV programs, news, uh, newspaper, and also social media. We pay for it. It's not free. <laughs> so uh, we believe that that's the way that we can reach our population, our uh, local uh, medias that spread the information to our community through the language they speak. Now I'm test fighting for uh, the Immigration Health Initiative and uh, Asian American immigrants face health disparities in cancers like breast cancers and also liver cancers and lung cancers and different chronic disease such as uh, health disease, uh, heart disease, hypertension and diabetes, especially mental health. And, and increasing number of uh, people are suffering mental health during the pandemics. So uh, the funding allow us to expand our outreach into community to inform and educate and the resident regarding uh, availability of cultural, linguistic, uh, appropriate health care services. So, and also we provide health insurance resources and we found that a lot of people are uh, lack of insurance because of the time pandemic or they, uh, and also immigration status, they are afraid to get the health insurance. So thank you for inviting me to be here. And uh, I hope that uh, we can continue to get the funding from city council for immigration health initiative. Thank you so much. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Mon Yuk Yu to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Mon Yuk Yu, Executive Vice President at the Academy of Medical and Public Health Services. Thank you, Chairman Chaka, for the opportunity to testify. AMS is a not-for-profit organization in Sunset Park <clears throat> that works to bridge the health equity gap among communities of color by providing free clinical screenings and bilingual mental health therapy integrated with individualized health education and social services to the immigrant populations of New York City, free of cost and regardless of immigration status. During COVID-19, our work has become more important than ever before, offering over $150,000 in cash assistance and 200,000 200, pounds of food and weekly food distribution and reaching over 400,000 people through our outreach and, ed and education efforts. I want to tell you the story of Maria, an undocumented immigrant. She never learned to read or write, turned away at the hospital reception because she could not communicate in English, Maria borrowed money to see a private doctor to find out that she had COVID-19 and diabetes in March of last year. When she came to AMS, our social worker connected her to follow-up care, helped her navigate free treatment and complicated online patient portals so she could understand her results, and helped her secure funding for diabetes medications, while our mental health therapist provided free, ongoing care in Spanish. Our cash assistance program helped her pay her bills and even enrolled her in our adult, and we even enrolled her in adult literacy classes with individualized tutoring. Maria is one of the 1,500 residents that receives food deliveries and distribution from us every week. This is the type of holistic support that organizations like ours provide. I would like to urge the city council to consider restoring and expanding the immigrant, mental, the, the immigrant health initiative and mental health services for vulnerable communities to support this work. 
Over the course of the pandemic, requests for assistance have tripled. Every day, our team fields 50 to 60 calls for individuals like Maria seeking, seeking clinical and social assistance. We have waiting lists of nearly 100 individuals seeking support from our free mental health services, which we cannot meet by our current funding levels. Time expired. And AMPS has been at the forefront of COVID-19 testing and vaccine education and steps up in imaginable ways. Our community health workers offer interpretation in Spanish, Arabic, and three Chinese dialects to help community members navigate the healthcare and social assistance systems. Every month, we're holding in-language workshops and distributing thousands of pieces of literature to community members through canvassing and food distribution events and post to over 700 businesses. And since March, we've distributed over 100,000 pieces of PPE. The city's vaccine outreach has been less than equitable and it's organizations like ours that are closing the gap. Immigrant communities average about 12% in a vaccine uptake compared to 35% of majority white communities. The Upper West Side community, for example, um, with half of Sunset Park's population densities has vaccinated 30,000 more people, 30% 30, 30 more people than Sunset Park. We are working with health and hospitals to coordinate vaccine blocks for immigrant community members, connecting 250 to 300 people to vaccines every week. Many who are telling us we are the first organization to offer linguistically competent services to connect them to the vaccine. And even though we serve as a vaccine navigation pop-up site, we are not funded to do any of this work through test and trace, even though our staff spends over 60 hours per week on this work. And we're asked to seek subcontract opportunities with the few T2 funded organizations that don't have the obligation to partner with any other groups. We need to replicate the census funding model to sustain this work for nonprofits that are meeting community needs on the ground. And we also urge the city to restore and baseline the $12 million in adult literacy funding. And during the pandemic, adult literacy classes have served as a lifeline for community members during the pandemic to not only secure the language access skills necessary, but as a platform for COVID-19 information and resource dissemination, as a community and solidarity, and a source for mental health support. And we loaned devices to community members that could not afford internet access for their classes, which dips into our reserves due to our funding cuts this year. And the city council must fund emergency food pantries like CBOs for CBOs like ours, which are completely unfunded at this time. And finally, COVID-19 has demonstrated the need for a coordinated community-led response to ensure that up-to-date information is circulated in communities and that community voices, voices are elevated on a policy level. With the city allocating $20 million in funding to start the Pandemic Response Institute, Funding must be allocated to involve community grassroots organizations, many which have been left out of planning conversations and risk once again leaving immigrant communities from this response. We are here to support those who are most marginalized and we ask that you be here to make our work possible. I humbly thank the City Council for this opportunity to support and for your support for organizations like ours who are providing on the ground culturally competent services during this challenging time. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now turn it to Chairman Chaka for any questions for this panel. I, I wanna say thank you to the panel, to um, all of the organizations that are holding the legal services, the healthcare, the mental health care issues. Um, thank you for re-aligning our work, not just in the work that New York City experiences and in, in these initiatives that we need to refund and expand, but also as a as it pertains to the federal conversation about what it looks like when government is filling the void of services to immigrants, mm -hmm. uh, to language, uh, or for our language access, for legal services, for health, the city is clearly not meeting that gap. And that's why we have you. Uh, and that's why we need to continue to fund you. So I wanna say thank you again for, for, for doing that work um, and, and we we have we have your your back. We're going to continue to fight for that, and keep focusing on the local council members that represent you and the organizations where you are at. We're going to need that energy to push for these budget successes. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm just going to ask if any other council members have questions at this time. Councilmember Chin. Time starts yeah. now. Yeah, I just also wanted to thank this panel and all the advocacy organization for the work that you do for our immigrant population. And, and echo what um, Chairman Saka said, we need your voices and we need your support in pushing the city and other council members 
And what, Mario, what you talk about? Yes, you know, it's not just legal services, but case management, mental health service, health services, the broad range of services that our community need that we need to fight for. Um, we have to be very optimistic with the federal dollar that are coming and to make sure that immigrant population get a share of that and that we don't get left out in this next stimulus package that's coming to the city. So we need all you all your to be on the alert and let us know um, what we should be doing and we need your support. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Um, seeing no other council member questions, I'm gonna thank this panel for their testimony and we'll be moving on to our next panel. In order, I will be calling on Sienna Fontaine, followed by Nicole Rojas, followed by Ernie Collette, followed by Henry Lahara, followed by Charlene Obernauer, followed by Tito Sinha, followed by Giannina Enriquez, followed by Cole Dennis. Sienna Fontaine, you may begin your testimony when you are ready. Great. Thanks. Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Sienna Fontaine and I'm the legal director at Make the Road New York. We thank Chairman Chaka as always for your leadership and the committee for your partnership and the opportunity to testify about the proposed budget priorities that we believe center the critical needs of immigrant New Yorkers as they continue to endure this devastating pandemic. Make the Road has over 20 years of experience serving low-income and immigrant communities and our programmatic offerings, community organizing, transformative education, policy innovation, and crucial health and legal services all have continued uninterrupted throughout the pandemic. You're all acutely aware uh, and have heard even more today about the devastation this pandemic has wreaked on our communities. We serve in central Queens, Brooklyn, Staten Island, areas which have been epicenters of the pandemic at different moments this past year. Our communities have been sick, have lost work and income, been forced to endure unsafe working conditions and have been excluded from government relief packages. Additionally, immigrant communities continue to face aggressive ICE enforcement and risk of family separation. We ask the council to stand with us in our values and fund the following priorities this coming year. One, health services, including maintaining current funding for ending the epidemic, access health immigrant health initiatives, and restoring funding to the managed care consumer assistance program. The city should increase funding for the emergency food assistance program to support food for more than 500 pantries and soup kitchens in the city, which are keeping immigrant communities fed. Two, supporting workers across the board, including restoring funding toward the Consortium for Worker Education and its network of partners, many of whom you're hearing from today, which includes 5.1 million for the Jobs to Build On program and 2.2 million for worker service centers. Renewed and expanding funding, expanded funding for low-wage worker support services is critical, including support for the low-wage worker initiatives that fund both legal services and outreach and organizing efforts. Past funding has allowed groups like Make the Road to represent immigrant workers on wage theft and discrimination claims and I'm inspired. on their rights. Um, work that's really urgent during these uncertain economic times and, is, and uh, as essential workers continue to confront challenges in the workplace. Three, continued robust funding for immigration legal services. You've heard today specifically for uh, the Rapid Response Legal Collaborative and other deportation defense work. These projects provide critical representation for community members who are detained and facing deportation, have orders of removal at risk um, of ICE detention. As you heard and you know, detained clients remain at high risk of COVID exposure and face serious delays in securing any relief. And lastly, adult education continues to be critical in this moment. And we request that the council restore and baseline funds and further invest in the adult literacy pilot project that the New York City Coalition for Adult Literacy has proposed and ensure that every adult student who needs it is provided the necessary hardware and free internet to be able to access online education platforms. Uh, there's much we have to do, but we must fund our values. Thank you again to the committee chair, the entire committee for your ongoing support and consideration. And, and we're excited to work with you to ensure that these community needs are prioritized in the upcoming budget. Thanks so much. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Nicole Rojas to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Nicole Rojas. Uh, I am the community organizer at Make Stick Organization. Uh, thank you, Council Member Carlos Menchaca and the Committee on Immigration for allowing me to testify. 
Um, Stick Organization is a community-based organization located in Sunset Park, Brooklyn, that addresses the critical needs in health, education, social, and legal issues facing the burgeoning Mexican and Latin American immigrant community. Over the years, our space has become a second home to community members. It is a safe space to receive services free of cost and in their language. 20 years later, as our organization continues to grow, so do the needs of the community, especially in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. When COVID-19 hit, our phone lines remained open and our, our work continued. When other institutions and agencies closed its doors on our members due to language or legal status, it was up to us in all female migrant woman team to continue supporting our community. Our community was heavily impacted due to the inaccessibility to adequate information due to technology, literacy, and language. Community members called and messaged us in desperate need of money to survive, feed their family after losing their jobs and even family members. We began fundraising right away to support community members. A few months later, we were granted funds by Moya to support immigrants excluded from the stimulus relief. Through that funding, we were able to support 530 families, though it was not enough when we received over 3,000 applications from all over New York City. In the past, we received funding for programs like Moya's Know Your Rights Project. In September 2019 to June 2020, we conducted over 40 KYRs, Know Your Rights workshops, and reached six, over 600 community members. We continued this work in the midst of the pandemic and adjusted to meet the needs of the community as best we could. This year, we were not granted the project. We need funding to continue projects like these that empower our community and fighting. The Biden administration has brought back hope for an immigration reform, La Lucha Sigue. If this is passed, the city is not prepared to support the community. I call for funding to provide sufficient immigrant-friendly services. I call for funding for free and safe legal services. I call for language access for the indigenous community for languages like Quiche, Nahua, Mixteca, uh, Quechua, and Mije, just to name a few. I call for increased funding for identifications for our undocumented community members who remain invisible to the system. I call for economic relief for our immigrant community, many of which are now facing eviction. I call for funding for community-based organizations like us to continue doing this crucial work. Lastly, I'm the daughter of immigrants daughter of a deported parent who was handed over by the NYPD after my parent fell, fell victim of legal services fraud that placed him on deportation proceedings without him knowing. I called to defund the NYPD. If the city offered sufficient, well-funded, safe legal services, I believe other little girls like me will not be left without their father-daughter dance at their quinceañera. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Um, I'd like to now welcome Ernie Collette to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Good afternoon. Thank you so much to the committee for allowing me to testify. My name is Ernie Collette. I'm the supervising attorney with the Immigration Law Project at Mobilization for Justice, a nonprofit providing humanitarian and family-based immigration relief to our clients. One of the benefits of actually uh, going towards the end of uh, testimonies that you kind of get an opportunity to provide a bit of an epilogue um, and maybe um, sort of a, a warning for the future uh, with regards to services for our city. There are many factors that continue to impact immigrant communities in New York and emphasize the need for increased funding. As some of the uh, presenters have already uh, presented before, numerous policies have been planted by the prior administration, including the public charge rule, attorney general and BIA decisions to restrict and attempt to eliminate asylum altogether, USCIS case processing delays, especially with employment authorization cards so that individuals has access to be able to be employed, and a lack of proper customer service to effectuate those problems have made it so that the routine becomes complex and the complex becomes exceedingly difficult. But despite of those policies, we continue to see increasing number of immigrants asking for our services. With regards to the immigration court, the prior administration restricted the rights of immigration judges to control their own dockets. And that's especially traumatic for individuals who are SIG eligible or are SIG approved. Prioritizing removal, um, especially when cases are pro se and uh, doing that above due process rights. While we monitor the new administration's attempts to effectively eliminate bad policies to uh, 
support an agenda that support, supports our clients. The reality is, is that's actually going to increase the needs of our services. The reinstatement of the migrant protection protocol across the southern border, as we've seen through prior spring caravans, would likely remote, result in more individuals coming to New York and seeking legal assistance. Our partners um, and our agencies have seen an increase of individuals asking if they're eligible for DACA and trying to receive initial DACA applications. And in fact, if Congress passes the Citizenship Act of 2021, even if it's in, in its current iteration, that could increase eligibility for a pathway of upwards to 3 million people for DREAMers, TPS recipients, and their family members for citizenship. And it could be as big potentially as 11 million people. The history of our city suggests that many individuals eligible for the sorts of reforms that we will try to help will be in New York, will be low or no income, and will need assistance adjudicating their cases quickly to meet their need. Finally, and of course, the, the COVID-19 pandemic disproportionately impacted the immigrant communities in New York. We have an immigration back court backlog that's been effectively frozen, even though we have continued to adjudicate cases and meet statutory and judicial uh, deadlines. Um, over well over a million people um, all over the nation are waiting for their case to be adjudicated. Um, and as a result of all this, increasing funding to allow for eventually a reduction of these backlogs, but not only understanding that what this new administration is effectively going to create more opportunities, wonderful opportunities, which we welcome and promote, but need to be adequately reinforced and supported by the city in order to ensure that no immigrant is left behind. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Henry Lahara to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Yes, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you to all involved and, um, and present. My name is Henry Lahara. I'm one of the legal service providers at Youth Ministries for Peace and Justice. We're a community-based organization founded in 1994. We're located in the Southeast Bronx, the Bronx River, Soundview, Brooklyn, and Park Chester communities. Uh, we serve a diverse population covering all portions of the globe. We not only assist our Bronx community, but accommodate all metropolitan New York. Since 2006, we've guided our immigrant community through the complex world of immigration. We offer in-depth consultations, file pertinent applications, and serve as liaisons between our government and state agencies, including USCIS and the National Visa Center. We are two case managers and two immigration attorneys. Since then, we've seen thousands of clients and help save hundreds and thousands of dollars in attorney's fees. We've also deterred our community from the services of predatory notarios. Because of COVID, there's a high number of unemployed immigrants. On permitted occasions, YMPJ helped fund a number of USCS application fees, namely DACA. Uh, this philanthropy was met with tears of gratitude and a client allegiance that lives on. All our services are free and confidential. We are currently funded by IOI and Legal Services, CSBG. In 2016, YMPJ helped form the Bronx Immigration Partnership. Uh, BIP is a group of 16 legal service providers who address immigration issues. Through our listservs, we um, confidentially share cases and recommend best practices. Uh, we also support the community by providing legal clinics. Uh, we do Time expired. Uh, uh, DACA, TPS, and current immigration trends. Uh, because of these services, potential clients are calling us nonstop. Our clients are pleased with our services, evidenced by their repeat visits and referrals made. Therefore, there has been an increase in demand for this service. So uh, the mayor's 2022 uh, uh, preliminary budget uh, currently reduces our immigration services. So that's, that's why we're um, asking for continued support. So we're gonna thank you for, for all this. Thank you so much for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Charlene Obernauer to testify. You may begin when you are ready. 
Time starts now. Hi, everyone. My name is Charlene Obernauer. I'm the executive director of NICOSH. I want to thank Chairman Councilmember uh, Manchaka for your time. And just thanks to everybody who've been on here this whole time listening to all of the stories. I think everyone should be funded, but <laughs> I'm here to talk about NICOSH and our program. Um, so we have the New York Healthy Nail Salons Coalition, and we um, run the New York Nail Salon Worker School. And as many folks can imagine, nail salon workers have been really at, um, in a devastating position during the pandemic. They have been mostly out of work, even now that the nail salons have been reopened. A lot of workers are still not welcomed back into their, into their salons because the, there aren't enough customers. And what our nail salon worker school does is provides people with the nail salon license so that they can be licensed manicurists in New York state. And for many workers without their license, they're less likely to be rehired during the reopening. And they're also more likely to be exploited on the job without having the ability or feeling like they have the ability to speak up because they were never licensed to begin with. And our um, school really looks at how we can train folks who have limited literacy. A lot of our, our program is actually based on limited literacy folks. Um, and it's directed towards Spanish speaking and Nepali speaking workers. And since 2016, we've helped 800 workers graduate from the school and ultimately get their license. We've also added to our curriculum information about COVID-19 and little things like how to wear masks. You know, folks are still not really aware of how to effectively wear something like um, a face mask. And so we're providing people with that information as well as, you know, how to make sure they're not spreading COVID-19 on the job when they're back in their salons. So this is all really critical information so that nail salon workers can stay safe, so that their customers can stay safe, and so that they can effectively be safe and healthy. Um, so we're asking for this funding to um, be continued. We've received both discretionary funded as well as the low wage um, worker fund, and we love your support. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Tito Sinha to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Thank you very much. My name is Tito Sinha and I'm the supervising attorney for workers' rights at Take Root Justice. And we thank the committee for this opportunity. I'm here to testify on behalf of the Citywide Immigrant Legal Empowerment Collaborative, SILEC, in support of increased robust, sustainable, and multi-year baseline funding for the Low Wage Worker Initiative. As we arrive at the one-year mark for the onset of the pandemic, we impress upon this body the ongoing urgent need for workers' rights advocacy for low-wage documented and undocumented workers, the vast majority of whom are essential workers performing essential services on the front lines. Much of our work under the Low Wage Worker Initiative is geared toward recovering money that were lawfully due to immigrant families from their employer and which can provide them with substantial economic assistance, especially during the pandemic. For example, since January 2020, Take Roots Workers' Rights Team has obtained approximately $800,000 in settlements from employers, which have provided much needed recovery, actual money for low wage and immigrant workers who are owed such wages. We have also responded to an increased need in immigrant communities to provide know your rights trainings for organizers and workshop and workers on the new uh, protections and remedies under the pandemic. There is no other dedicated city funding that ensures that the city's low wage and immigrant workers have redress from wage theft, discrimination, and other workplace injustices. We call upon the administration and the city council to continue their commitment to the city's low wage and immigrant workers by renewing and expanding the baseline low wage worker initiative for employment related legal services from $2 million to $6 million for employment related services and providing an additional $1.5 million for the low wage worker support. This expansion will stabilize the funding so low wage and immigrant workers can continue to receive the essential advocacy expired. they need through vital civil, civil legal services and community outreach. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, I'd like to now welcome Giannina Enriquez to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. 
Good, up, good afternoon, Chairman Menchaca, members of the committee. My name is Janine Enriquez. I am the commuter organizer from Queens Museum and an immigrant Latina working for her community. Thank you for continued support to the Queens Museum during these difficult times, and thank you for the opportunity to testify today. As well, a special thank you to the Council Member Moya for coming to visit us at the museum last week for the launch of our new immigrant business initiative, Echo Local. Like other members of New York City Cultural Institutions Group, the operation of Queens Museum were significantly impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. Despite this, we continue to offer essential programs and research to advance and support public health, public life, and public benefit of Queens residents, and especially the immigrant community. Today, I would like to highlight a few of our long-standing and current programs. For more than 10 years, in partnership with the Queens Library, the Queens Museum New New Yorkers program offers free multilingual art classes for adult immigrant learners. New New Yorkers interact closely with accomplished professional artists through courses that emphasize the arts, technology, and English language acquisitions. Since June of um, so in June of 2020, Queens Museum has been working in partnership with La Jornada to where we can and now with Common Point Queens to serve more than 20,000 people from Corona, Elmore's and Flushing as a food distribution site and cultural food pantry. Every Wednesday we distribute, distribute weeks work of food items between 400 and 950 families. We also provide education handouts, art making, kids and outdoor activities for the children. We are now serving as a self-testing site in partnership with New York City Health and Hospital Test and Trace Program. As I mentioned before, a recent donation from Material for the Arts of Industrial Sewing Machines inspired the launched Echo Local Program. Echo Local is an online workshop series of product development and distribution in collaboration with Christine Jack, the owner of our gift shop, The August Tree. Finally, the Kindergarten at Home is a program provided by families in Corona, Queens, with plant seeds and materials to grow edible gardens in their homes. Give the Garden a Home was developed in partnership with the extensive networks of local communities gardeners. The report back as pictures we have received are all ray of joy as kids and parents engage together in transplanting and caring for the new plants. Thank you to the committee for this opportunity to share information about Queens Museum programming. We look forward to our continued partnership with the Consul and value our, our leadership as we make our way through the crisis and look to rebuild the economy. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Cole Dennis to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Cole Dennis, a resident of the Upper West Side and a member of the New York City Democratic Socialists of America. Nearly all of the time I spent outside my apartment in the past year was spent protesting the NYPD, its racism, and its outrageous allocation from the city's budget. For this reason, I want to thank Chairman Chaka for voting no on the city's budgets last year. The NYPD doesn't keep immigrants safe. I ask that the council fight to take from the NYPD's budget to instead allocate to services that benefit the undocumented community during the pandemic when they are in the most need and give special attention to the Asian community that the NYPD has failed to keep safe during the rise of hate crimes against the community. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to now turn it to Chairman Chaka for any questions for this panel. Uh, thank you, Harbani. And I, I wanna again say thank you uh, as we get closer to ending this hearing, this hearing has highlighted a lot of issues and I'm really thankful that each of you in the organization work that you're doing really highlighted the the, the intricate nature of a, of a worker uh, and experience. And I'm thinking about the nail salon workers. I'm thinking about um, all of the families that are delayed in their justice uh, at, the, at the federal courts. All of these pieces continue to be uh, part of this larger fabric of what the city can do right now to support people. Uh, people that are trying to get vaccinated, trying to get a job, trying to get a, an adult literacy class, trying to get a lawyer that's safe. And I, I'm just, I, you know, I have some final thoughts that I'll share in a little bit, but this this panel just really, I think, 
took it home in term in terms of what each of you are all already doing to fill that gap. Uh, whether you're in Sunset Park like Amps and Mixteca or in Queens like Make the Road, uh, you're you're filling that gap. And in a lot of ways, this 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 um, infrastructure is already there. You're already doing the work. What's preventing the city from funding? Uh, and to the most recent point made by Cole, we can do that by defunding the NYPD, an agency that um, has continued to create a lot of issues with immigrants, as we saw this summer, and that we all, not only, I, many of us made the call to end uh, when ICE and DHS was was protecting precincts. That's just one of many examples uh, that show the collusion between the NYPD and ICE. So I just wanna say thank you for, for your courage and, and let's continue. I, I, do we have any more folks that are testifying? Um, I'd just like to quickly ask if any other council members have questions. First, Council Member okay. Chin. Time starts now. Thank you. Um, I also really wanted to um, thank this panel, especially um, all the service provider and, and advocacy and some of the points that you brought up that I don't, I want us to also um, take note of it is the, the mental health services for the staff. Um, so we, you know, don't forget supporting the people who are doing this work of helping the immigrant community to make sure that they are uh, supported. And also I think what uh, Tito was talking about, um, the program that you're doing, helping worker recover wage debt. I mean, that is so critical uh, because, you know, how dare they during this pandemic that they're still taking advantage of this low income workers. And I'm so glad that there are, you know, lawyers out there, organization out there, they are helping these immigrants. And also we gotta make sure that, you know, as we move forward with, you know, hopefulness of, of uh, you know, from Washington, that we want to make sure that our, our community are not gonna be taken advantage of from all these immigration fraud and all these things that we've heard of uh, in the past. So we have to make sure that we provide uh, the sufficient funding and also make sure that some of these works or baseline or get incorporated because infrastructure is there uh, for city to really help the immigrant community. And we have to make sure that you are sufficiently funded. So I just want to thank you again for all the great work that you're doing for our community. Thank you, Council Member Chin. Um, at this point, we have concluded public testimony. If we have inadvertently missed anyone that is registered to testify today and is yet to be called, please use the Zoom raise hand function now, and I will call on you in the order that your hand has been raised. Okay, I'm not seeing any hands. Um, so that concludes our public testimony for the day. And I will turn it back to Chairman Chaka for closing remarks. Thank you uh, to Harbani and Elizabeth and Lorena and Tony and all of the staff, uh, Florentine, Krillian on the finance side. Uh, thank you all for today. Today, we have learned a lot. And many of these things that we have learned today were already things that we knew uh, seven years ago when we first came in and started fighting together on this committee and in the city council. And what we've learned is that the city is not in compliance with local law 30. And so what can we do? Uh, one of the issues that we can, or one of the ways that we can solve this issue is through funding to bring more language interpretation services that are asked of and built by the communities that are serving, currently serving our communities. And also bring in adult literacy courses uh, to refunding and to by sixfold fully funding the need that is in our communities. These two elements will help support the engagement of communities that are found in the blind spot uh, that this current mayoral administration, the state and the federal government continue to allow. But it is this city council that has supported you all in the work that you're doing on the ground through the day labor organizations, through uh, the low, low income worker uh, uh, initiatives, 
through the adult literacy initiatives. There are so many pieces of, of what we are holding right now that, as Councilmember Chin said, need to be institutionalized to ensure that you have a horizon, that you have a flexible contract, that you have enough dollars to support the most vulnerable. Uh, and we're not going to be able to solve all of those issues unless we have the support of you all. So push us as council members in your districts to ensure that they know how important this is. Councilmember Chin and I uh, have been on this on this call this whole time, pushing and understanding what you're asking for, but we cannot do it alone. Um, also ensure that you can help us get the BNT going. That's a, a big issue that I, I have been asking for, for the speaker to really restart. Uh, you should know that those things are not happening yet, but that can't happen unless the pressure happens. But the pressure I think needs to be beyond the city council. We need to bring the state energy and the state legislators and the federal uh, delegation from, this, from the Congress uh, that we sent to Congress to ensure that the city budget can reflect the needs that we can make happen here. Uh, as we push them to do that in their budgets, that's how we get things done. That's how we can tell a story of, of New York, the, the immigrant story, the story of resilience, the story of empowerment, especially on this International Day of Women, uh, a very auspicious day today that we are calling on our New Yorkers to get involved. So with that, I wanna say thank you again. And uh, this ends our budget hearing, but this does not end the budget negotiations. And so stay, stay engaged, uh, build your, your campaigns, uh, make them connect, and we will be there to ensure that that voice lands on the city council and, uh, and shapes the next budget. Thank you so much. And I call this hearing to end. Thank you all.